I mean, and and I don't. You don't defer to someone Morning, because everyone. of because of their title. You don't defer mm -hmm. to people because well, that's of appeal their... to authority. It's a logical fallacy. Well, traditionally, it was anyway. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, um, now but it's kind of the resume most people show up with. Don't right, you but, know? But I mean, there is something to be said for okay. The man actually does like you know fur and sight research, like you know, viral attachment to cells. I mean, this is yeah. what he does his work on. Okay, right. And he's published and, you know, so that that's credential. Fine. But then right. you have to still just say like, OK, well, what did he say? What, what was I thinking about the, this week? Oh, just uh, how often, you know, un, how there's all these qualifications used in headlines. Right. So this is media. So it's like uh, unproven or, mm -hmm. um, f you know, um, baseless. And you're mm -hmm. like, OK, that's a value judgment. Yes. And it's well. It's also an assessment. It's of editorializing the, of, of data. It's mm -hmm. it should be assessment of data. It's not. There's no data right. attached. Right. And just said, well, they keep making fraudulent claims. Okay. Mm -hmm. Says who? Right. Well, the courts. The courts that didn't actually listen didn't Which allow courts? them to present yeah. data. Right. Okay. So you're saying fraudulent courts declared somebody else fraudulent. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how does that actually work? And now you're just you're just baselessly ha huh, echoing baseless yeah. claims. Yeah. So is it projection? I... Well, of course. It, well, it's mouthpiecing. You're just doing what you're told. But... Right, right. So that's what I was thinking about. Just how, it's like, like the whole how... thing with SSRIs now that's out. It's out, out. <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard posted it, so it's politically out. Everybody knows now. The jig is up. But how many people are not? <laughs> kind of. Kind of. How, how are people going to react? N they're not. Well, here's, here's what it is. Because it's just like, um, you know, if you've got all your, all your jabs, you know, um, Somebody made this point. And I think they were right. I think it was uh, Brett Weinstein saying that, um, the, like the people trying to get out ahead, whether it's Burks or Fauci mm -hmm. or whatever, trying to out, get out ahead of yeah. the narrative and kind of yeah. say, "Well, I never really quite said that," you know, right. backpedaling a little bit, yeah, or a lot of just you know CYA. Then uh, why are they doing that? They're not doing it for you and I. No, no, they're doing it for the people who listen to them Correct. and who still believe them. Yes, because I saw they don't. Some of them this morning. They they don't they don't want to leave those people out, you know. They really don't want them to consider to consider themselves fools. Never mind, they're only trying to pre protect their own reputation. They're true too. believers, and it's a cult, right? So I was thinking about that with the SSRIs. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I mean, if you've been on these things for twenty years, yeah, and exactly. and and whatever whatever effect right. it's had, maybe you've mm -hmm. had little to no you know side cool. of, negative side effects, and that you know of that you know of, right? And but how would you know? And you have perceived benefit again. Perceived, not right. observable. Well, yes. well, any medication it has perceived benefit. I mean, that's correct. <laughs> right. It's always about perception, whether sure. it's actual or not. It doesn't really, exactly. It all. We said that before. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter whether it's a placebo effect or not. Right. It, if it works, it worked. Right. But here's the thing: if a majority of the population are ingesting SSRIs mm -hmm. daily, how mm -hmm. would you even know as a society whether you're not nope. you're mentally ill? Well, never mind. And therefore, the benefits water supply, that you're right, right, turning well, yeah, frogs gay too. and all that. Yeah. So I know a guy been on testosterone for a while. Again, like SSRIs, his uh, his testosterone count was fifty eight when he got tested recently. Give you like when I went to see my doctor, what? he said you heard me <laughs> fifty eight. So when I went to see my doctor uh, to get my testosterone checked, like he's on a with, clinical dosage, like a large dose. Oh, no, he's been injecting steroids for a while and not for health benefits. Well, okay. you, you know, health benefits in the, in the sense of <laughs> bodybuilding and sculpting and so forth. Right. Obviously, right, body dysmorphia. My doctor says if it's under 350, bodybuilding is dysmorphia? Of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> but my doctor said to me, if, if, your, if your testosterone numbers are under 350, we consider that a crisis. And we need to, like, step up, you know, this the uh, testosterone replacement therapy, which I can't beyond because I don't qualify it for it because my testosterone is too high. Woot, woot. And the point is then that this guy is at 58. So he can no longer function without testosterone injections. Oh, I see. Yeah. Because of his age, because of what he's done to his body over the years it, by using this, the right. perceived benefits are entirely, we talked about this on the last episode, actually, about the external versus the internal regarding matters of faith. Mm. Or civic righteousness is specifically we what we were addressing with young sure. Goodman Brown yeah. is that in the realm of civic righteousness and within his ecosystem, he's a champion. He's a success externally, but internally 
all of his numbers say, if you go off of this or we try to taper you off of this, the, the consequences for your overall um, health and well-being could be catastrophic. So now we have to keep you on these drugs. It's kind of like, it's like the alcoholic with their liver. Well, I was listening to somebody talk about dope sick last night because when I went off opioids, I, went, I was dope mm -hmm. sick. And as, as this person said, you don't even know what pain is until you're dope sick because that's pain from the inside out. I, th like I mean, I think I'm probably only now like, like able to function without pseudofedrine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like my, like I know what it's like. Mm -hmm. to, like it hangs on yes. for a long time. You're just, right. and you're just like, I didn't realize like, man, I was. It changes um, your brain chemistry. Yeah, I was. Yeah, it's I not was, a small thing. I mean, I was highly functional in high school. I mean, very, very highly functional. Right. But I didn't realize that. It, yeah, I was like basically on meth the whole time. Right. Small That's a problem. Microdosing a problem. meth effectively. <laughs> 100 percent. And a lot of kids were. Yeah. And, I mean, I used pseudoephedrine in college to come up from the opioids I was taking. Oh, yeah. OK. That's that's a fun cocktail, by the way, to be on downers and uppers simultaneously. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's like I drink a cup of coffee or no, I guess you just put the whiskey in the coffee. Well, yes, in, in my family, that's that's what you do. Yes, Irish coffee. <laughs> yes. Well, we played into the stereotype pretty hard on that one. So How that being the, said, yeah. huh. yes, a lot of fighters, Melody points this out on the line. Oh, we're not even recording, so I don't have to say that. So Melody says a lot of our fighters in the early 30s are having, yes, low testosterone. And yep, yeah, exactly. Um, is that that's what I tell the young guys that I train with, too, that I'm 51. I still well, I haven't fought for three years now. Um, if I do fight again in November, everything that I do is by natural means and just doing things like I don't eat sugar <laughs> and right. I eat a high protein diet. I have to supplement with carbs just because I train and teach seven days a week. Mm -hmm. right. um, but the point is, is that, yeah, you have to figure out what homeostasis is for you. And then and so for me, for example, for the first three years that I was fighting, I fought at 170 and I felt great. I felt fast. But then when I would train with people at the gym, I would get crushed because I was so light. Right. Well, my body's homeostasis is 182 pounds. And I know this because I'm at 182. I fight at 185. Nothing I do to force myself to go to 190 works other than just eating garbage. And, and yeah, and what does that right? actually get you? Because then you so, get the inflammation. Right. And so I just else. said to my coach, listen, yeah. I'm going to fight at 180 to 185 from now on because I can cut the weight and I can win. But it hurts me at my age, especially. It just affects me negatively. Versus I'm just going to come into the fight three pounds underweight if I have to, or come in at like I ate a full breakfast and I weigh yeah. in and then I sweat it off. But I feel better because that's my homeostasis and everybody's homeostasis is going to be different. But by supplementing it with testosterone and HGH and, and all these, you know, terinobol, synthols, all these different things. Yeah. You, again, in the short term, it makes sense. And especially when you're young, like you pointed out, when you get on these things in elementary school, middle school, high school, right. college. Right. And it becomes, you know, habitual for you and it's quote unquote normal. Then when it, when you have a dip or something happens where you go off of it and you get that immediate kind of cliff experience, like you do when you go off opioids or ephedrine, right. you think to yourself, oh, something's wrong. I got to get back on right away. So normal becomes abnormal. Right. Well, I would, I would have chronic headaches I like, yeah. because I, what, when, oh, I yeah. when I didn't take it and you're like, right. well, actually <laughs> right. now in well, here's a, you know, in a benign way, I can have two cups of coffee during mm -hmm. the day. If I have yeah. a third, I get caffeine poisoning and I feel terrible for like three hours. And obviously That's since like I love five or six for me. So, well, I do, I do a double shot, which is actually two mm -hmm. double shots. So it's right. actually four shots. Um, so yeah. So if I have 12 shots of espresso during the day, I get sick. Now I know that. That's but the, probably pretty typical. Right. But I'm yeah. saying though, is that I know that, but I also know how much I like coffee. <laughs> So I like cost, you know, you know, and it's like some days I'm just like, eh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> do I know it's going to affect me? Yes. <clears throat> do I do it anyways? Yeah, because I love your coffee. Yeah, fair enough. But, but I know the consequences. I feel them versus if I was caffeine sick all the time and then I stopped drinking coffee. Right. This is why I, I like your coffee. This is a plug for your product. But like I, when I drink your coffee, I don't feel like having more coffee all day long. Mm. So then I don't get caffeine headaches if I don't have coffee for a day yeah, or two. Yeah, less coffee, versus, better flavor. That's, right. That's, versus yeah. in the old days, 
you're drinking coffee constantly because it's garbage. Because you're trying to hit that. Well, you're trying to get the rush. Right. And then you go off of it when you're sick, for example. You get the flu in the winter. You're not on coffee. Now Mm -hmm. you have a migraine for three days because of the coffee. Like all of these things go into your decisions. But if you're not aware of the consequences because everyone around you does the same thing, then you can't even really diagnose what the problem is because you don't know what to look for if you don't know what to look for. Right. But you're, I mean, you're, I guess, dancing around this whole, um, you know, theory of disease, yeah. which is that it's not, it's not primarily, you know, pathogenic mm-hmm. if, if at all. I mean, that's, I'm not sure I right. can completely disqualify pathogens as having an effect, but, um, but, but that it is, if it is pathogenic, it's collaborative mm-hmm. with environment, right? Yeah, so if, like you were saying, you have a lot of sugar. I'm, you're, <laughs> you're going to be more susceptible to to whatever the sickness is yeah well, you'll, like lethargy and then you sit around and what do you do when you sit around right watch netflix watch disney watch Ma- hbo max you're on the internet more you're doing things that play into your sedentary lifestyle and all of a sudden it becomes your lifestyle right but i've been thinking about this in another reg- just personal evaluation is that i've been you know chasing a, a kind of a high I, I think it's dopamine maybe but yeah um you know i'm looking for good news and oxytocin Maybe it's oxy too, yeah. Well, oxytocin is the sex hormone, the intimacy hormone that gets released, right? right? That's why people love falling in love because they get that oxytocin and that dopamine hit and the endorphins kick in. Right. And it is the exact same part of your brain that cocaine goes to and sugar right. and Percocet. I was I was thinking just in terms of like news, right? Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of, I guess, quote unquote, good news as of late. Sure. You know, it's not very encouraging. I, would, I, mean, <laughs> I don't want to just be a black pill, so you can't just consume black pill stuff. So you're looking for mm-hmm. better, but you never. But when you don't find it, right? Um, there's just something, and it just like drags you down, right? You're just like, well, well, that it, also it, is an endorphin hit though too, because it mm-hmm. again brain chemistry. I do have right. a black eye. Interesting. Okay. Um, but I mean, I guess the point is, it's like, well, why are you chasing it anyway? Because mm-hmm. you're not going to find it. Because you're habituated and you don't know what you're actually chasing. Well, of I've course, talked about the... my addiction before on my podcast, and once I it was revealed to me the root of my addiction, yeah. Then I realized I was chasing the impossible, and now I haven't had the cravings since then. But I needed mm. to be shown this is actually the bottom basement root of your addiction. You're chasing what's impossible, and I also learned last night, actually speaking of, that I have a craving for self destruction, which is typical <laughs> of a lot of of addicts. Okay, I could have told you that. Well, I know, but I'm just saying, the way it was phrased, I was like, oh, yeah, fighters, addicts, soldiers. Uh You're (laughs) right. Like, there's a certain class of people who are, they crave self-destruction. Well, with addiction, you're trying to get backwards to something that you can't recover, but it is waiting for you in the future. That that warm, weightless, muted, dark place that you're trying to get back to, it's out there in front of you, too, which Mm -hmm. is why you chase the dragon. It's always a possibility, right? Well, you want death. That's what you're craving. You crave mm-hmm. death. Right, right. You can call it whatever you want, but in the end, you want to die. The noble because death, that's a good the death. What I, however you want to frame it, doesn't matter. Right. And yes, appetite for destruction. Very clever. Dad joke. Um, <laughs> Melody, don't they have absolute divisions for you? Because um, most of the women that I train with do absolutes just because they, yeah, they you don't just, hit 145. They're like pick- 150 to 165 of just muscle. So, yeah. They and just then draw. I also. What's that? You just draw someone. That's it. Well, an absolute is it's open. Any weight, cl- any weight. Right. Open. Yeah. yeah. So, that being said, let's hit the button and uh, start recording and get into. Uh, okay, I'm rolling. The sermon, as it's called. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Rawhide. Okay. Oh, you want um, some? S- you need your your go go music here. My go juice. Your go juice. My go bag. My go music. The go goes. Can you hear me? I used to have the biggest crush on Belinda Carlisle when I was a kid. That was so adorably cute. That was her thing. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 261. And we are, as always, your host, Christopher Gillespie. Chilling and willing, maxing and relaxing. And I am Dom Riley. My coach gave me a black eye this morning. Pretty proud beautiful. of that. I like that. That's beautiful. Uh, we are today going to read the sermon. For those yeah, of you who are unfamiliar this, right? with the sermon, it's from chapter nine 
of a little book called Moby Dick. Maybe you've heard of it. It's about a maybe fish. Maybe you I think. were forced to read it. <laughs> yeah, maybe you were forced in high school to pay attention. So you probably skip this whole bit because you're like, oh, right. good night. L gratefully, my teacher, my lit teacher, made us watch the movie. <laughs> there's, he was a good. There's nothing man. more American education than that. Isn't hey, it? he understood. He accepted the terms. We want to get. We just want to yes. get like a get have a broad recognition of right. the significance of this piece of literature. Right. Even if you right. don't read it, just watch the movie. He was a great guy. He was ex special forces, ex Green mm -hmm. Beret. I think you've talked so about him before. Really high yeah. and tight. The, my my uh, librarian was a Green Beret too. They were both Green Berets, ironically, Weird. in Vietnam of all things too. So at the time, I didn't appreciate and or understand. And then as I've gotten older and heard guys from the Green Berets who were in Vietnam talk, I'm like, wow. And you guys had to put up with us every day? Like, that doesn't seem like a reward for your service. But uh, no, he loved me because one, I was friends with his daughter, and two- High school I, students, Viet Cong. I don't know. I know, right? I mean, <laughs> I'd rather take, I take the Viet Cong because at least you know what you're up against. <laughs> like, there's too many wild cards over here in the high school. <laughs> I love well, Amon Um No, I'm very familiar with Amon Amart, and I listen to Amon Amart when I spar Muay Thai. It's one of my favorite bands to listen to when I fight. But go. um Viking metal, dude, how can you go wrong? But um no, I read, so he loved me because I was a reader, so I would actually read stuff. Oh, and I he gotcha. was just you know. But uh being an atheist in high school, I, same thing. I, I got to this and just passed right over it because it doesn't matter, it's not important to the story. Because it's about a guy chasing a giant fish, right? I mean that's what it's about. I don't know. I think it probably <laughs> set uh you know, metaphorically it, mm -hmm. it was like uh, set kind of my pattern of things that I was interested in. Sure. You know, that, I guess, dark Gothic kind of, Yeah, you know. So let's um, address that because we addressed it with Hawthorne. We keep bringing yeah. up o. Henry and just that whole genre at that time. Right. What was going on in the Americas in the mid 1800s that Gothic, well, Edgar Allan Poe, same thing, mm -hmm. that sure. you have this genre that comes out of a time which seems to be. <clears throat> the Shelley, excuse me, uh, Shelley's, right? Well, they were British, but yes. Right, but it's the same, same time, time frame, period. Yeah. Is, yeah, so it's continental too. Right. Um, what was happening socially and just in Europe in general that mm. gothic horror became the thing, the popular genre? Because Bram Stoker's Did, Dracula also came out of that, that right. time period. Right. Right, which apparently I learned about this like two years ago that that was actually Bram Stoker. Like Dracula is about him being a closeted homosexual. That's what that was. Oh, okay. That's what he claimed anyways. After the yeah, fact, but they, like, I mean, they were running in him. the same, same yeah. social circles. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein because she was basically protesting against, you know, for women's suffrage and women's rights and mm -hmm. the fact that she had to kind of, yeah. yeah. So Frankenstein's monster for her was like this feminist statement. And we talked about it in relation to like science fiction of the 20th century, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne and others. They use science fiction as a forum to express their views mm -hmm. and opinions about social issues, but they couldn't just state them outright. And we've talked well, about we, this in relation to uh, uh, Mark Twain and satire right. and how satire is a genre. Right. You and I are keeping it alive, but it's kind of a dead genre nowadays. What happened? Um, Gad Sad would be the best example, I think. Sure. Like, um, at least one that I'm regularly encountered. Like that's all he does, right? Is he satirizes? Because um, otherwise, well, it's kind of the side door. Like if mm -hmm. you're trying to get into someone's psyche and help them yeah. recognize, right? Um, maybe the, a mistaken idea they have or mm -hmm. the way of thinking. I mean, because like James Lindsay, we talked about this with like the woke ideology. Mm -hmm. He just comes at it, you know, full frontal attack, right? Right. Which is why and I think it, a lot of people don't listen to him. And they shut him off. That's right, because it's so fatiguing. And plus, he plus he does deep dives, so right. that uh, but people I don't have the too, attention span for that. If you compare Gadsad to Michael Malice as another social who's critic, also a satirist yeah he's a satirist but he's too cheeky in my opinion like he's winking at you when he satirizes well things, he's more when, of an absurdist than he is yeah a there we go that's better yes whereas yeah. gad sad is more of a satirist you don't know all the time when he's being serious <laughs> and when he's not because again the i think tell me if i'm wrong here but the foundational assumption of satire is you're smart enough to figure out the joke and those who don't right it's not for you Right, right. But I either, thought about that. Way, like Alice in Wonderland was that yeah, way. Right. You know, it's obviously a critique of the Queen. I mean, <laughs> right, a, a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> and the drug culture and all this kind of stuff is in there sure. too. I mean, yeah. but it it doesn't have as long as you're not being uh, completely direct. I mean, it also like we mentioned last time, 
um, I think. Yeah, we were talking about satire being a way to avoid uh, libel and slander laws. That too, yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. you can be critical without having to go <laughs> go to court with people. Right, right. You know? Erasmus, uh, uh, theologically speaking, Erasmus of Rotterdam, in yeah. praise of folly. That's a satirical attack on the Pope and the papacy. Sure. Yeah. Which wasn't that veiled, which is why he got called out for it and ended up writing on the freedom of the Christian, or the freedom of the will. That was his way of saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here's me playing by the rules. I'll attack Luther. This proves that I'm credentialed and that the party can still trust me. I but satire I mean, has always been there. You go back to Greek philosophy, it's Diogenes was a satirist. So I think, you know, you mentioned Gothic. I think it, it partly is, is, the, is a fruit of the, of the uh, not the Reformation, but the Enlightenment. Yeah, In a sense sure. that the Enlightenment had, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, I guess, what we today call psychology, right? Yes, yeah. that's right. right Crimson so, Peaks, for example. If mm-hmm. you've ever watched that movie, Crimson Peaks, by Benicio Del Toro. Right. That's Gothic. Right. So like the nature of man and of the yes. mind, yes, uh, and and like trying to evaluate emotion, and, mm, yeah, um, and and then obviously there's types, you know, mm-hmm. you're talking about, um, you know, later on you get with young, that kind of stuff, yeah. So you have that, and then, uh, you know, but there does seem to be a great deal of evil in the world. That's well, maybe, is it a reaction to that? That it's a reaction to unwarranted optimism. Yeah, maybe. Like we talked about with Hawthorne, he presents a picture of Salem and the colonies as being this almost idyllic place for Christians. On the surface. And then know. pulls back the mask and goes, it's a horror show. Right, right. And maybe that's it. Is it it's, a, it's a reaction by critics to say, why are we avoiding the really dark elephant over in the corner? Yeah. Today's the, I think, the hundredth um, birthday of, I, I lost the guy's name. He was responsible for creation of a lot of TV especially in the 70s, um, uh, Jewish guy. Hmm, can't remember. Um, but it was interesting because one of the things that he never did was, ne- one, he kind of brought in the laugh track, and two, he never had politics. Hmm. Overtly, right? And so the, here's the point, is they never talked about it, right? In a, there was no, like, civics at all. Yeah. It was all just culture. Sure. Right? Um, but ended up, you know, manipulating a fair amount of... Um, uh, through culture, manipulating sure. politics. Uh, Maud was a show that the guy did. I can't remember okay. that. That was a spinoff, but which was so like the Maude, first show. All in the Family, The Jeffersons, right, Good Times. Right, that guy. That guy. Sanford and Son, Chico and the Man. Yeah, you're yeah. getting the list. Um, I know, now I can't remember his name, and I know all the shows he produced. Yeah. Uh, but on Maud, you know, it, like she gets an abortion, right? Yes. Now. Yep. I mean, that would, that you could even talk about such a thing. And we had this growing up too. Norman um, Lear. There it is, Norman Lear. Yeah, it's Norman his birthday. Lear. Yep. Um, who was I thinking of? Oh, uh, uh, the the show where the the two Down syndrome people got married. Uh, growing up, uh, yeah, 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 Corky. Um, yeah, Obla di Obla da. It was the theme song. Right, that um, was the theme song. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know everything about it except. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah, the after school special of sitcoms. Right, but the, my point was is that life goes you know, on. Was that the name of it? Life goes on. Maybe that's the name of the show. Yeah. No, I gotta look it up because I remember the that's the one the girl, song. the um, Tracy Gold or whatever her name was, had an eating disorder. Yep, life goes on. Chris Burke played Corky Thatcher. There you go. Kelly Martin was Rebecca. Chad Lowe was Jesse. That's right, Chad Lowe. So you couldn't talk about oh, anything, the good old and, days. you know, overtly, but they, but so much. I guess what you call psychological manipulation mm-hmm. to show what, like, well, here's actually what's going on in the back right. background. Well, was it really, or were mm-hmm. you actually just trying to push the ball forward by normalizing it through narrative? So to your point, Amazon Prime they made a new interface for streaming. And they have free TV. So I clicked on it to see what they had. <laughs> I only they have it an entire they the, section yeah. of 80s movie of the weeks. And so I was just going through what? all of them. Yes, it's all these 80s. Don't you remember the movies of the week? The yeah, 80s, no, I like remember. Like the after school yeah. special type of things. Yeah. And every single one of them was pushing some sort of cultural issue. Everyone. Huh. Yes. Look at that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can, and I think you can see it in pop music too, mm-hmm. uh, to some degree. Uh, maybe a little, even less overt. Mm Because it's not visual. It's not a visual medium. Unless you're watching a video, a music video. So so the point was... Got to serve somebody. You're using the media um, to maybe reveal something that that is not something you would normally talk about in polite company. Yeah. Right? So you have that with the gothic, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, perhaps, um, there's there's a suggestion here that we're not actually addressing the real problems. Yes, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and then through this you know we can talk about like man's pursuit of um you know monsters right with moby yes. dick yeah you know it's like which we all do mm -hmm. we're always chasing something well that's a great point though because that's the subplot well that's the subplot that's the plot of dracula it's the plot of frankenstein that's mm -hmm. how frankenstein begins with dr there's frankenstein lots of monsters yeah lots of monsters and lots of people doctors in this case chasing them and trying to exterminate them hmm yeah also yeah. william blake um, i was a huge william blake fan in college oh, yeah. um well that was also the time when satan became an anti-hero to enlightenment thinkers and artists and musicians and poets and so william blake they wouldn't even use that terminology but you're right yeah yeah he yeah, well he was he was seen as an anti-hero because he rebelled against god the ruling authority mm -hmm. and was kicked out of heaven for revolting against the aristocracy of heaven and therefore the peasantry of britain france the united states revolutionary mentality because we're only like a couple you know decades removed from the revolutionary war the war of 1812 so there's that aspect too of like, you know, Satan in this case is like, he's the hero of the Bible technically because God is up there on his throne, just like the king over there, making us all do stuff, even though we don't want to do it, trying yeah. to take away our free will, punishing us arbitrarily and capriciously. And Satan's over here just saying like, hey man, give the people the knowledge of good and evil, give them enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Prometheus, the modern Prometheus mm -hmm. is the name right. of Frankenstein, right? Right. So I think that's a part of it too. Like like you said, you, we're pulling back the curtain. We're going to look at the dark stuff that everybody doesn't want to talk about. But then also, as it picks up steam, you also then get stuff like Blake celebrating. And, of course, Crowley comes along shortly mm -hmm. thereafter. And Satanism picks up speed, becomes kind of the, the, the fad amongst the elites, the wealthy elites, Satanism. Um, along with say, uh, seances and channeling. Eugenics comes out of that time period, too, by the way. Yeah, all that stuff. It's almost like a dialectic in a way that you you take you know people are inherently good, but then they they have this lingering evil, and the, right. the problem is they're not actually you know in a way of like mm -hmm. say Jordan Peterson, you're not actually addressing it, and right. because you're not addressing it, you can't you can't actually right. what steer that impulse or whatever in a and in how a did it affect the church? Direction. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Mm -hmm. Believe in God, be a good person, belong to your church, and you'll go to heaven when you die. Just right. your spirit, because your body's evil, but. Yeah, I mean there is there is an aspect, I guess, to the church of of therapy, <laughs> right. or being therapeutic, mm -hmm. um, but it's not it's not the kind that we're thinking of, right? No. It's not it's not chemical, and it's certainly right. not emotional, right? Um, or purely anyway, right? So, yeah. the sermon then from Moby Dick it does actually kind of provide the thesis for the entire book. Mm -hmm. Melville was was really astute in that sense, but also it's pretty yeah it's pretty slow slog until you get. Get the upside of point. Moby Dick is it's pretty obvious that Ahab is the old Adam and the whale is God. <laughs> and then everyone around the subsidiary characters, the non-player characters, Queequeg and others, um, Starbuck. I think I, um, always, I always assumed that they were actually the same, that, mm -hmm. that the whale and, and Ahab are actually not all that different. Well, I read a theological breakdown a while ago that the whale is the hidden God. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately what Ahab represents, of course, is the old Adam screaming out into the void mm -hmm. at the hidden God. And the only answer is, I'm coming for you. Yeah, I'm going to kill you. And also, for those of you who don't know, this is based on a true story. You can look it up on YouTube. There's lots of different videos breaking it down. But Melville heard the story of this whale that pursued a, a, a whaling schooner for quite a long ways, actually, and then destroyed the ship and then destroyed the lifeboats. And it became oh, a so rather famous tale. Okay. Yeah, Got so it. the premise is actually based on an actual event. Yeah. And I don't know if he heard it from one of the people who survived or if he heard it second or third hand, but... <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Nonetheless, this is based on a true story. Awesome. Kind of like and, the sinking of the Titanic is based on a true story. You mean that it sank? <laughs> well, the Olympia. We're, you're still going to believe that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Of all the, the of all the conspiracy stuff we post on Telegram, that that's like m far and away one of the most believable things. It really is, actually. When you like, look at the oh oh J P Morgan details. banking insurance fraud, but it's, yeah right. some, yeah collateral damage. I get it, but these are not necessarily. Have you ever all... read anything about his personality? Actually, do you know <laughs> anything Morgan? about J P no. Morgan's personality? He was not a nice person. I, well, he was a robber baron par excellence. Right. You want to talk exactly. about a low anthropology? Look at that dude. Yeah. 
not a nice guy. And just the and the thesis that actually, well, we that we weren't really planning for that many people to die, <laughs> right? <laughs> The rescue boat just wasn't quite close, as close as we thought it would be because it yeah. had gotten lost. And I'm like, oh, good night. Right. And the compass what? was broken. And well, what are the other things that you're like, can you imagine if you were criminalized today for like disputing, um, you know, JFK, um, mm-hmm. you know, the JF- official narrative, JFK. Yeah. Right. But that's effectively, effectively what we've done with people who. Correct. Like dispute COVID or dispute um Nine, right, nine eleven, uh, right. Sandy Hook, obviously. Right, um, you know, it's interesting. I got a, a rather strong reaction to something I wrote on Instagram, positive, like a really strong positive reaction. I said, if the government funds it, the media talks about it, and education teaches it, don't believe it. <laughs> and well, was like, at least be skeptical. Yeah. Yes, you're a hundred percent correct. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just saying, be open to the possibility that if the wheels of government are turning in one direction historically speaking we have plenty of precedent but does it even make sense because you know like anybody in a like if you have any interpersonal relationship with somebody yeah. you know there's always two sides to every story yeah of course there's at least two at sides least, to every story yes. right so there's no official narrative i mean there is but there's <laughs> well you saw i posted in, in the, our telegram group the band pastors on telegram that the new zealand prime minister came off yeah like, right the only <laughs> The only news that is true is government statements. Like that's like the UN yesterday. That when I posted, the the UN says there is no conspiracy of global elites, <laughs> so we're going to <laughs> censor and delete everyone who says that we're doing this. It's like <laughs> I know. I mean, they have to laugh y- at it. Y- you y- have to. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, Chapter Nine, The Sermon. Father Mapple rose and in a mild voice of unassuming authority ordered the scattered people to condense. Starboard gangway there. Sideway to the larboard. Larboard gangway to starboard. Midships. Midships. Because everyone in his congregation is a part of this whaling community. Mm -hmm. He's making maritime references. This should also be noted that this sermon is something that Melville would have heard growing up and just... Right. In general, because in whaling towns, villages, of course, before they went out, they went to church for a blessing. It was very common. Um, and it was common for the ministry to accompany the sailors to the ship and to bless the ship and to well, pray and, that and God And the minister ended up taking care of the, the orphan families, basically? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that being said, then, I just want to include that, that this isn't, he's not making this up out of his imagination. He's actually referring to actual sermons he's heard. Mm-hmm. Because you can, I'm sorry, I know way too much about this. You can buy an annotated Moby Dick that gives you these side notes and footnotes and, and notes that tell you details about the text as you're reading it. Okay. Like I have the annotated Alice in Wonderland because it's my second favorite story ever after Where the Wild Things Are. I always meant and, to get it and I never got around to it. And it's it. just, it's fascinating to read the annotations because they're all from um, uh, Carol's notes and letters mm-hmm. and, right. and Alice Little and all these things. And as you read it then, like you said, well, who is the White Knight? Or who do, um, uh, who is the, the egg, um, Humpty Dumpty? Mm-hmm. Who is Humpty Dumpty supposed to be? And, and all of these questions that you might have of like, why does she go through a looking glass? Or why is the Mad Hatter's tea party important? Why is the Mad Hatter mad? Like the annotated books tell you so that as you read, it kind of flushes it out. Right. Kind of like study Bibles are supposed to do that. But sometimes well, it's prob- it probably has about the same level of authority as a study Bible. There we go. Father Mapple rose and in a mild voice of unassuming authority ordered the scattered people to condense. There was a low rumbling of heavy sea boots among the benches and a still slighter shuffling of women's shoes and all was quiet again and every eye on the preacher. He paused a little, then kneeling in the pulpit's bows, folded his large brown hands across his chest, uplifted his closed eyes and offered a prayer. So deeply devout, that he seemed kneeling and praying at the bottom of the sea. (laughs) This ended in prolonged, solemn tones, like the continual tolling of a bell in a ship that is foundering at sea in a fog. In such tones, he commenced reading the following hymn, but changing his manner toward the concluding stanzas, burst forth with a pealing exaltation and joy. The ribs and terrors in the whale arched over me a dismal gloom. 
while all God's sunlit waves rolled by, and he lift me deepening down to doom. I saw the opening maw of hell, with endless pains and sorrows there, which none but they that feel can tell. Oh, I was plunging to despair. Down, down, down we go. I know, this is a great hymn. In black distress I called my God, when I could scarce believe him mine. He bowed his ear to my complaints, no more the wail did me confine. With speed he flew to my relief, as on a radiant dolphin born, awful yet bright, as lightning shone the face of my deliverer God. My song forever shall record that terrible, that joyful hour. I give the glory to my God, his all the mercy and the power. Did, did you have to use the accent? You did. I did. <laughs> it's capitalized. You have to. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we should note uh, for our you know, young folks that listen to this is that words like terrible and awful don't have the same connotation right, right. then as they do now. I, I always have to remind myself of this. I'm, More along the lines of like, wow, that's amazing. Or, whoa. <laughs> yeah, like awful as in awesome and, yeah. and terrible as in like... Oh, I don't know. What would be an equivalent? Overwhelmed by fear and awe. Yeah, Just exactly. overwhelmed beside yourself. Right, right, right. Um, and of course, these are characteristics of God. Right. Um, you know, because he's unapproachable, right? Right. Actually, uh, speaking of, Maurice Sendak uses that term terrible in Where the Wild Things Are quite a bit. Mm. Their terrible eyes gnashing their terrible teeth. Terrible, terrible, terrible. What's that mean? Mm. They're monstrous. Hmm. Okay. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is uh, what a great you know, hymn, though. <laughs> right. So what you know, we were talking about Gothic and what is Gothic. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't help but wonder then if you know the hymnody is at least a reflection, if not, it's informing. Yes. You know the kind of literature and yeah. like it's this deeply existential, emotive, um, you know, kind of hymnody that's it, it's not communicating a lot of information, you know, right. doctrinally. <laughs> right. It, it's really just trying to put you in the moment of, yes. you know, being spit out by the whale. I, you know, right. I don't remember actually God's face shining in the midst of that. You know, mm. it's it's like he's transposing that the author of the mm -hmm. hymn was transposing um, what Daniel, mm -hmm. you know, in, into Jonah or something. Yeah. You know, with the radiant face in the midst or yeah. the fiery furnace or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting uh, to me, too, though, that this hymn is sung as they're preparing to go out mm -hmm. right. to see. And that it's addressing the very real possibility that they could die. It almost is like um, a soldier going into battle that way. Yes, right. Because it's like, no, we, ha we have to deal with the painful reality that a lot of right. people don't get back, come back. Right, we're not day. going to pretend that they're going to go out and all come back in in a, couple, in a month or two or three. Because we know for a fact that some of them will be destroyed by storm, some yeah. will be destroyed by the sea. We don't know. North Atlantic whaling is not exactly right. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah easy it's, work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to say the least, right? right? And so let's prepare. Let's all just, again, stare at the thing. Let's just stare at it and acknowledge this is what this is. But in the midst of that, as you noted, whether mm -hmm. you're in the belly of the whale or at the bottom of the ocean, Davy Jones's locker, your deliverer God is there with all of his mercy and power. Right. So There's, so it's almost, yeah. it's almost like that. Uh, we've talked about it, maybe even complained about it a bit. You know, that just the promise of heaven is laid out before these people. Right. So like, well, whatever right. happens, you yeah. know, God's going to save you. So. Right. And no matter where your grave may be, mm -hmm. he knows where you're at. He'll, he'll come and get you. Even if you're Because that's always a question the, to this day that you and I yeah. as pastors are asked. Well, what if my body is burned? Or what if I'm mm -hmm. lost at sea? Like, what, what if I can't be buried? What if I can't have a funeral? Mm -hmm. Right? Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world, in the sky, at the top of a mountain, in a cave, under the ocean, in a grave. It doesn't matter. Your name's written in the book of life. That's all that matters. He made you. He can remake you. Isn't it interesting how, how much we deny um, the giftedness of the body, you know, right. in, our, in, our, in our culture? It's, that's yeah. an old Greek problem, too. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and yet, like... We're, we're so desperate to actually have a visitation and be able to see the body of, right. of those who die. Yeah, we all we are superstitious if we're nothing else. Well, maybe. 
I mean, even even you know those who are cremated, it's, it's mm-hmm. like, well, no, there was somebody there before, and right. and they saw them legit dead. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's like we're not going to believe it or something. I don't know. Well, it, yeah, it it leaves. There's something know, open ended because without the body. I've had people right? at my church die who were cremated and or buried, and I didn't find out till after the fact. Mm, okay. And there's a sense of they're still there. I don't know why, but there's just this sense, whereas when I've sat with people who have died and helped prepare the body before the coroner gets there, right. there's a sense of finality to it because you're handling the body. This person, whoever that person was, he's not here anymore. That, that much is obvious. This mm-hmm. is a corpse. And you can walk away from the house in this example and say to yourself, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> he's definitely dead versus when you don't have that moment yeah, they're, they're, they're dead. You know that because you've been told and the grave's right there. But there's just, I don't know, there's something missing. Yeah. Well, and I guess, I mean, I guess getting lost at sea or, or dying at, at sea yeah. is, is a lot like, um, you know, again, military, like POW, mm-hmm. you know, MIA especially, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like in all those, un, you know, unmarked graves or... Right. Are or they just... still out there? Were they rescued? Are they in some other port trying to get their, find their way home? What well, happened? there's a white there's a white cross in a cemetery, but we didn't actually recover right. any remains. Exactly, right. And so, so you imagine, like you know, especially if um, this is a family member or friend, mm-hmm. you know, are they really gone? I, I guess that's. Well, I've talked about this with people who have had children who were kidnapped, mm-hmm. or adults who were uh, taken. They mm-hmm. were kidnapped as well, and they never find the body. There's almost a mania on the part of the loved ones, the family, the friends, to find the body. Because, of course, you don't want to say she's dead. You don't want to say Mm -hmm. that because that's final. And this is someone you love. But yet you know pretty certain, you know, 99% certainty that she's dead. But then you see these cases where they do find this girl eight years later, you know, or she's been trafficked and they found her in a different country. Right, right. And so you're still holding out hope that she's going to come home someday. But you know pretty specifically that she's probably dead but again without the body without that knowledge and maybe that's the point is it's the knowledge part of it i need to know Mm -hmm. and i need to know definitively one way or the other otherwise you live in this limbo this purgatory where you're where logic says she's probably dead but hope says but maybe not right so here i mean the preacher through the hymn is i you know directing people Mm -hmm. to I guess someone, it's, it's it's not physical knowledge, but but at least some kind of knowledge faith. that will help. Yeah. Yeah, faith that will see them through, you know, whatever's coming. Right. Hmm. And I think that's a good point, too, is there's nothing wrong with knowledge inherently, but knowledge has to come as a consequence of faith. Knowledge can't be the foundation of your faith because there's so many things that we don't know about you, God, yeah, you about don't, ourselves. You, you can't believe in knowledge. Right, Correct. Scientia, you know, it's like believing mm-hmm. the science. It doesn't yeah, make any exactly. sense. You, well, you have science. The scientific method, but yes. Right, you yeah. have science, you have observation. Right. Uh, and maybe you have a set of hypotheses attached to this, but you right. don't hold on to them by faith as Correct. in like, I'm going, right. I, I have to believe this or my entire reality will change or something. Right. Well, and that's another side note that people without a God will invent one. <laughs> we talked about that in the last episode too. Trust makes both true and false gods. But yep. what faith does is it informs knowledge. So for example, obviously Nietzsche is somebody that I hump, I harp on a lot, I thump on a lot. I can read Nietzsche in faith because he's not a threat to my faith. And the knowledge then that I gain from him, I actually apply to my faith. Mm-hmm. But if I read Nietzsche and didn't have faith, He's not going to lead me to deeper faith in Christ. Uh, no. More than likely, he'll lead me away from deeper faith in Christ because I had no faith to start with. Mm-hmm. And so his critique of the church, his critique of Christians, his critique of the priests would lead me to believe the last place on earth that I'm ever going to set foot is a church to talk to a mm-hmm. clergyman. Right. So now versus, you're just, yeah. anything else is possible. Right. Whereas yeah. when you read Malachi, the first two chapters are devoted to God saying, I hate all the priests. <laughs> I curse them. And I'm going to make people avoid them. Well, if you read Nietzsche and then read that, you'd say, well, even the Bible says avoid priests. Right. Versus in faith, you can read both and go, I need to step up my game. 
So it's not just pure knowledge, um, because Malachi also is spoken by the one who not only gives you the knowledge of, Mm -hmm. of, of, I guess, evil generally, um, but also points you the way through because he delivers that to you as well. Right. Right. Is it 1 Corinthians 8 where Paul says all knowledge puffs up? Mm. Like all knowledge is good, but all knowledge puffs up. It might be 1 Corinthians 8. It's in the Bible. But he, yeah, it's in the Bible. He warns against it. So nearly all joined in singing this hymn, nearly all, which swelled high above the howling of the storm. Oh, there you go. A brief pause ensued. The preacher slowly turned over the leaves of the Bible, and at last, folding his hand down upon the proper page, said, Beloved shipmates, which is the same as saying brothers and sisters in Christ, Mm -hmm. the context. Beloved shipmates, clinch the last verse of the first chapter of Jonah. And God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good trip. <laughs> it was a little on the nose, right? I, yeah. Um, Spoilers. I, ima- I imagine <laughs> these are not generally people. This is kind of like a, um, what, what's the service you have at the end of like a school year at a Christian university or whatever? Mm-hmm. You know, a commencement or something? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know it's a Christian university. Most of the people there don't go to church regularly. Right. So you could probably use Jonah every year. Yeah, every time 100%. these guys go out, you're right. always using Jonah. I might Jonas. have to start using this sermon for Confirmation Sunday. Because <laughs> they're never going to hear it. Again. Well, yeah. and it, They it weren't actually, there the last Confirmation. It's appropriate. Let's just, put it, let's just put it this way. The Confirmands <laughs> are like these sailors. They're going out on rough seas. <laughs> and more than likely, most of them ain't coming back. Yeah, my point was that he could reuse. Uh, he probably always preaches this is some some variation. Oh, absolutely, of course, because yeah. he's a yeah. pastor. I don't care which pastor and what decade it is. <laughs> if you got material that works, you you mm. lean into it. Well, and ultimately, it's an occasion, right? So yes, exactly. Preach occasionally, because there's a whaling season in mm-hmm. the North Atlantic in particular. Right. So shipmates, this book containing only four chapters, four yarns is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. I love that statement. This book, containing only four chapters, four yarns, stories that is, Mm -hmm. is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. And yet, what depths of soul, the soul Jonah's deep sea line sound, What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet. What a noble thing is this canticle in the fish's belly. How billow-like and boisterously grand. We feel the floods surging over us. We sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is this lesson that the book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson. A lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. Isn't that great? It's so good. In the yeah, movie, which we'll post a link in the show notes, the pulpit is the prow of a ship. Also on the nose. Yeah, also on the nose. Well, he's relating to his hearers, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Maybe he was the sailor too, right? At some point. I can't remember if they say that in the book. I must, I think he was. I'm. Again, it's been a while since I read it. Yeah. But he, yeah, he's familiar, right? Again, he speaks the language of his people, which is something that Capon points out in his books. When Jesus speaks, his lessons, his sermons, his teachings are all in the language of the culture. He talks yeah. in agrarian language. He talks about, you know, cattle and sheep and goats. He talks about fig trees and olive trees. He uses the language and speaks to them in language they can understand. In the same here. And I only bring it up because Gillespie and I have both been guilty of this. And we've heard plenty of pulpiteers do it too. You don't preach a book report and you don't sound like a seminary professor. Mm. Right? There's far too many clergy who think that that's the, the goal of the sermon is to make sure that you dot all your I's and crosses all your T's so that your seminary professors would be proud of that sermon. I mean, I'll push back a little bit on that. And then well, please do. I, I, well, I... I think you're right in regards to preaching. I do mm-hmm. think there's a place for it. Um, in Bible study. Yeah. You probably do have some more academically minded people that would appreciate that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but then that can't be your only Bible study either. I mean, that's it. Right. 
So, so you have to kind yes. of. But again, um, like I said, it's contextual. For example, right, right. 11 miles east of me, two colleges. So a lot of the churches have professors in mm-hmm. the congregation. Right, it's a, right. They're more of a quote unquote white collar. My congregation is very blue collar. There's very few people that even have college educations, like bachelor's degrees, who are in my church. Yeah. And they don't care how many degrees I have. And they don't care yeah. about my dogma or my doctrine. What they care about is that when I speak to them and when I teach them, which again, in Bible study, I'll bring up Hebrew and Greek words. I'll bring up Latin and German. I'll talk about history and this stuff. But in the pulpit, they just want me to give it to them straight. Right. And I, and I think what it doesn't matter which context you're in. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, generally people are pretty biblically illiterate, even if they consider themselves intelligent yes. um, or knowledgeable. And then, but the, the second thing is that it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, it, they expect you to preach as one who has authority, right? Just exactly. in the way that Jesus did. Great point. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that is going to change contextually because yeah. the, the respected authorities have different characters, right? Right. Exactly. You know, right. if you're with farmers, you know, mm-hmm. well, who's going to be the respectable farmer? Right. right? Are the one My the sermons respects? probably don't play well in suburban congregations. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I'm just saying I've been here 15 years. And so the language I use is very blunt and brutal and to the point. Get in, get out. No flowery statements that go on yeah. for, you know, lines because that's my people. Mm-hmm. But that being said, then when I do go into different areas and conferences, retreats or do speak at different churches, I don't change the way I talk. But I do pay attention to my audience. I do pay attention to my surroundings. I read the room. Right, right. And adjust accordingly. I guess I'm still just trying to find the congregation that that uh, speaks to, or that listens the way, prefers to listen to the kind of speaking that I do. I don't really know. Right. <laughs> right. I well, if you speak adjust. with authority and you speak God's word, there isn't right. one. Right. Right. Ultimately. Right. Because right. we're all sinners. Right. And so in the end, we show up for church on Sunday. And even though we know what to expect from our pastor, we're still hoping. We're just, come on. Pastor, meet us halfway. Give us maybe a this little... the, maybe this is the Sunday where he cracks Sunday where he cracks a smile. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe he makes us cry. Maybe this is the Sunday that he finally appeals to my emotions, and then at the end of the sermon, instead of talking about baptism, he talks about what we can do. Or maybe this is the Sunday where he uses a sermon illustration, or where he talks about yes, himself right? for once. <laughs> or makes a Reader's Digest joke at the beginning of the sermon. Yes. Oh, oh, I've got a whole book of those. Oh, every church library in the Lutheran Church has one of those. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I had my, my vicarage supervisor had four long, like a box that you could carry rose, long stemmed roses in full of flashcards, four of them, flashcards that were like three by four. And mm-hmm. each one of them had an illustration and a quote on it for sermons. Ready on, to go. Ready how to go. It, you just pull, it was, how a was it short, organized? It was a, you just pull one out? I don't know if it was topical. Okay. It was topical. So the front of the card would have a quote and the back of the card would have a quip. So you'd have your joke, but you'd also have a relevant quote from some wow. famous person for wow. your sermons. Wow. Four boxes, and he used them. All right. So just we're not being critical yeah. here, actually, of the preacher here in the text, because no, uh, no, I'm just pointing out exactly what we would argue that he, he is do. speaking the. He's blunt. He's brutal, and he's speaking the language of his people because it's a brutal life. And but what they're, they're going to know about like uh, the the cables, right? Because they have those 100%. on the ship, exactly. With the yes. strands and everything. Yeah, yes, the illustrations are even yes, uh, beautiful, you know, precisely relevant. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson—a lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men, it is a lesson to us all because it is a story of the sin, hard-heartedness. Suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance, prayers, and finally the deliverance and joy of Jonah. As with all sinners among men, the sin of this son of Amittai was in his willful disobedience of the command of God. Never mind now what that command was or how conveyed, which he found a hard command. But... All the things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence, he oftener commands us than endeavors to persuade. Oof. Mm -hmm. And if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. Beautiful. I, I I remember reading this um, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering like 
you know, how would the pe- how would the hearers respond to this? Like, right. you know, I mean, at this point, right. it's like, well, what is he actually telling us to do here? Right. Right. Because I mean, clearly, he's never been on a boat, and he doesn't know the kind of things that happen on a boat. Right. Exactly. Well, that's that's what I was thinking too. Of, like, I've been on like sailboats, like small sailboats that hold like uh-huh. six people. Right. And when the wind takes the sail, and the pilot yells at you, grab that rope and secure it. And you grab the rope and you get whipped to the mm-hmm. other side of the boat. And you're like, I'm going over. I'm, I'm going over. That's all this. Right. That's, right. <clears throat> you realize very quickly how little control you have over your immediate circumstances. Hmm. So imagine being on a whaling vessel, like a schooner, where you have hundreds of men and you're trying to turn this thing and you're chasing a fish that is larger than your ship in a lot of instances. And then you got to go out on rowboats to attack the whale and you got to bring it back. Like think of all the things that you don't have control over in that moment, let alone just sailing out to sea. It's like I was listening to someone last night on the podcast I recommended to you, Real Ones with John Berenthal, talking about this, uh, talking about um, spirituality with a former Delta Special Forces operator. And yeah, again, I'm not agreeing with anything this guy said, but he had a great definition of the universe as his God. He explained it. And I was like, oh, thank you. Finally, what he means is this. The universe is bigger than me. I have no control over it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't create it. I was like, oh, that's, that's how, yes, that's the hidden God. It's bigger than I am. I don't have any control over it. And I didn't create it. And so therefore I worship it. I'm like, Oh, it has authority over you to your earlier point, right? Mm-hmm. And so what do we default to for our false gods? Things that are bigger than us that we have no control over that we didn't, well, we think we didn't create it. We end up creating our own false gods out of those things though, like the weather. And sometimes they get out of example, control. Yeah. War, right. Love, all of these things that we make gods out of. Nowadays, people make that the universe. I threw this up to the universe and waited for a response. <laughs> Thoughts and prayers. <clears throat> right? This black void, this abyss. And think about that in terms of going out to sea, though. You have no control over the sea. You have no control over the weather. You barely have control over the, 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 the uh, cork that you're floating around in the ocean on. Right. This debris. And then you're going to go out and chase things that are bigger than you. That you mm-hmm. also, they're bigger than you. You have no control over them, and they were here before you. So yeah, but there, there is something about that. Like, I mean, that's obviously the theme of the of the entirety yeah. of the book. But like, f- fighting against the ancient foe, right? exactly the yes. one that's the never Leviathan. been conquered. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So in a sense, it goes back to Job when God says, "Were you there when I made Leviathan?" So stop critiquing me. Right. So the, I mean. Like, what is the point of chasing this thing that can't? Yes. That's why I say the sermon seems relevant in that regard. Right. Yeah. And we'll get to that because, well, I think Ahab's response is somewhere in Mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So with this sin of disobedience in him, but again, at least this minister, because we talked about, you know, reading sermons by Puritan uh, preachers in the future here, at least this pastor, this preacher, he gets the law, meaning... Mm -hmm. The whole reason you think you can obey God's commands is because you're actually really just obeying yourself. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, you know, he's dealing with, well, with hardened people. Well, right? these are hard people. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Hard so, people, I mean, there's no, hard life. There's no point in softening this up. Right. Th- th- these are not right. people that work desk jobs. Right. I wonder mm-hmm. what the life expectancy of a whaler was back in these days. It's probably about the same as a coal miner. Yeah. So with this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men, well, there you go, Mm -hmm. will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharves of Joppa and seeks a ship that is bound for Tarshish. There lurks, perhaps, a hitherto unheeded meaning here. By all accounts, Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. And where is Cadiz, shipmates? Cadiz is in Spain, as far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days, when the Atlantic was an almost unknown sea. Because Joppa, the modern Jaffa, 
Shipmates is on the most easterly coast of the Mediterranean, the Syrian, and Tarshish, or Cadiz, more than 2,000 miles to the westward from that, just outside the Straits of Gibraltar. See ye not then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee worldwide from God? Hmm. Miserable man, almost contemptible and worthy of all scorn, with slouched hat and guilty eye skulking from his God, prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas, so disordered, self-condemning in his look, that had there been policemen in those days, Jonah, on the mere suspicion of something wrong, had been arrested ere he touched a deck. How plainly he's a fugitive. No baggage, not a hat box, valise, or carpet bag. No friends accompany him to the wharf with their adieu. At last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarshish ship receiving the last items of her cargo. And as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors for the moment desist from hoisting in the goods to mark the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look, all ease and confidence. In vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the man assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In their gruesome, oh, I'm sorry, gamesome, in their gamesome but still serious way, one whispers to the other, Jack, he's robbed a widow. Or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist. Or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah. Or be like one of the missing murderers from Sodom. <laughs> that's so good. Another runs to read the bill that's stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering 500 gold coins for the apprehension of a parricide and containing a description of his person. He reads and looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd round Jonah, prepared to lay hands, their hands, upon him. Frightened, Jonah trembles, and summoning all his boldness to his face, only looks so much more the coward. He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion. So he makes the best of it, and when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, <laughs> they let him pass, and he descends into the cabin. This reminds me of, um, you know, like Luther and his preaching right. and the way that he'll take the text and just like, mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to say? Creative license, I guess, is the right Sanctified right speculation. Right. And again, it's for the hearers here. You know, right. he's, he's talking about, clearly the guy's been on a boat before. He knows what's going on right. out there. But right. is he wrong? That's the thing. Mm. Is the preacher actually wrong? In general, no. Maybe in particulars, of course, he is speculating. He's basically painting. A, like we've read Luther, when he describes Abraham and Sarah, you imagine that if you just walked down the street in Wittenberg, you'd meet them. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you left and went down to the docks, you expect to meet Jonah down there waiting for you. Right, right. And yet, like I said, in a general sense, he's not wrong because Jonah ran away from God. He was disobedient. Right. He is a criminal in that sense then, because he is a lawbreaker, first commandment, first and foremost. Yeah. And the sold, the sailors are scrutinizing him. Because again, pray to your God. And Jonah's like, it's my God. He's doing all this. And here's why. And they're like, dude. And he's like, go ahead, throw me over. It's the only way this is going to stop is if you throw me over. I'm like, well, we don't want to go to extremes. We're just upset that you didn't tell us. He's like, no, literally, the only way this is going to stop is if you like, throw me over and I die. Right. Yeah, that's so part's not, all in the text, though. Right, exactly. So he's not wrong in saying that. And this is the part, like you said, the imagination of the preacher. It's the same with the historian. As a church historian, you have to fill in the gaps in the historical record, and you have to make assumptions based on your education and your knowledge. I remember, what was it? Uh, I don't know what the context was. Somebody was being critical of Shelby Foote, you know, in regards mm -hmm. to uh, saying, well, he's kind of like, yeah, he read the letters, and, you know, he's... But he's, mm -hmm. he's really, he's being creative and he's just kind of filling in gaps. It's not a pure history. I'm like, yeah. well, what is it? What is a pure there's history? No, there's anyway? no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> Read a book on it's historiography like, and you'll quickly learn. Right, right. And it's like, no, I mean, I think along with, I mean, Shelby Foote then and pair him up with um, 
who did the Ken Burns, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for Civil War. And you're like, yeah, no, it's perfect. I mean, yes. I, I never understood at all well mm -hmm. and actually it's more of a gothic approach isn't it because yes, it it's is. right. it's it's not so much the, yes he talks about the battles and whatnot but it it's the people and the, the, right. like, the letters of the people right, right. And, the, and the existential crises that they're experiencing and well and you have to remember that history up until the enlightenment was considered a branch of literature it was hmm. never assumed to be objectively true no one made that claim well no I, one made the claim that the bible was objectively true it was inspired by god right and they just accepted that these men, inspired by God, wrote down what they were directed by the Spirit to write down right. in their own language. Right. And that over thousands of years, their stories line up. Right? It's like the Gospels. Like, all four Gospels are different. And that's a good thing, actually. You have four different biographies of Jesus. <laughs> and yet they all agree in essence, which is, he was born, he had a ministry, he died, and he was raised from the dead on the third day because he's right. the Messiah. He right. is the fulfillment of Scripture. That's really all that matters, ultimately. Everything else is just, hey, this is what I remember he said. John is perfect because he does that in parentheses constantly. After right. the resurrection, we remembered what he had said. So everyone's writing after the fact. But as soon as you subscribe to this scientific method approach to, to literature, Again, like we talked about with parables, parables aren't fairy tales necessarily. They're not just, hey, let's just make something up. No, these are based on actual events, and they're yeah. there to teach Maybe a lesson. Maybe even actual people. Yeah. Actual people. There once was a man named Lazarus who was sick. <laughs> right. And, you know, oh, is, is it the same Lazarus? You're like, right. Or no, with myth, that's what it was. We like Nowadays, myth means fairy tale versus it used to mean trying to describe something that is indescribable and incomprehensible. Yeah, it's a metaphysical story. There we go. It's a metaphysical story. That's kind of what parables, Jesus uses parables to basically explain mm -hmm. to us stuff that we can't comprehend. Why? Because right. so, in John chapter one, it says we, we don't comprehend him. We, and you, you made that comment, you know, objectively true. And mm -hmm. it's like, <laughs> this is, that's not even a question. It's not even a point. Right. It's like, is it true? Correct. And it's, you know, in what sense? Well, yeah. wh what do you mean? Right. Like in all the details right. or in the in the moral mm -hmm. <laughs> no <laughs> well truth is a metaphysical principle it used to be anyways <laughs> nowadays people treat truth like it's subjectively you know this way or that as a weather vane well it's mm. true why because you can prove it scientifically you do realize like 73 percent of all experiments aren't repeatable yeah and true i mean truth seems to be something you strive for i mean it's a virtue in a way well, now it's all about your truth find your truth Right, but you find it within, not without. Exactly. Yeah. Which is probably not going to work out too well for you. Right, so it's not transcendent. That's what metaph exactly. so metaphysical. Yeah. Who is there, cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for the customs? Who's there? Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just chew. You could chew this sermon for dinner. It's mm -hmm. like a steak. For the instant, he almost turns to flee again, but he rallies. I seek a passage in this ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him. But no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide, at last he slowly answered, still intently eyeing him. No sooner, sir? Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> Ha, Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from that scent. I'll sail with ye, he says. The passage money, how much is that? I'll pay now. For it is particularly written, shipmates, as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history that he paid the fare thereof, ere the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Hmm. There we go. Taken in the context. Now, Jonah's captain, shipmates, was one whose discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. Ha <laughs> ha. He's a wise man. He's got a lot of guile, but he really only exercises it when someone shows up without a penny. If mm -hmm. you're a paying customer, I'm willing to overlook certain things. Yeah. In it's kind of like, uh, 
you know, we, we have this weird view of piracy now. <laughs> right. Weird. Because <laughs> we, like, well, Somalian pirates or something, mm -hmm. you know, where they're just ruthless and just criminal entirely. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, gods into themselves, that kind of thing. That's not exactly the view. I mean, like, piracy, piracy was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, it was one of the chief strategies of the revolution. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, well, in we'd a lot intercept. of instances, because yeah. I actually watched, uh, I watched a documentary on uh, Ethiopian pirates. And most of them, in the documentary anyways, were driven to piracy because of poverty. Okay. They had no means. So they just started robbing people. And then some, one day, some guy just looked out at the ocean and went, wait a minute. Why am I robbing people on land? I can go, get caught by the police when I could just take a boat out there, climb up on the ship, and right. do that. <laughs> right. So, I mean, the idea that the that the captain would just take the fate, mm -hmm. the fare. Well, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You traffic anything, you know, mm -hmm. for the right price. I'm willing to overlook a lot. It's just a job. Yeah. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely and without a passport. Whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. And that, in and of itself, is a lesson for all of hmm. us. In this world, sin that pays its way can travel freely to Taiwan, for example, to the NVIDIA factory. <laughs> With jets and soldiers and t millions of dollars of my money. Who even knows? Who, Who even knows? But if you have the right amount of money, you can travel anywhere. Freely. I mean, it was a, it's a calculated move. It's just not really clear what the motive was. Right. Well, you know, the prime minister to the north of us, every day, got to wear your mask no matter where you go, no matter who that. you are. And then his whole family gets off his private jet at his private airport, and none of them are masked at all. They don't mask at all. Why? Because. I also learned this morning that uh, if you fly private, uh, you don't have any TSA problems. They don't check your bags. There's no... TSA to go through. Didn't you we just watch? Didn't we just watch that on uh, the terminal list? Right, he flies down yeah. to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> takes yeah. the guns with him and everything. Yep. Just like, fly oh. private. If you have the money, you don't have to go through the hassle. Yeah, you can take a whole like assault force with you. Exactly. Why not? So yeah, if you got the right amount of money, sin pays. But if you have virtue and you're poor, you're not going anywhere. Hmm. So Jonah's captain prepares to test the length of Jonah's purse ere he judge him openly. <laughs> he charges him thrice the usual sum. And it is assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah is a fugitive, but at the same time resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold. Yet, when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, prudent suspicion still molest the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger, anyway, he mutters. And Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah now. I am travel weary, I need to sleep. Thou lookest like it, says the captain. There is thy room. Jonah enters and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling there, the captain laughs lowly to himself and mutters something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. <laughs> All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then in that contracted hole, Sunk, too, beneath the ship's waterline, Jonah feels the heralding presentment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels' wards. So our friend Chad Burt has talked about this before, at length mm. about Jonah, is that the entire book of Jonah descends in, like, there's layers of descent. Yeah. That, that you're going down, down, down into death. It's not Maybe all the one basis time. of uh, Dante, right? Sure. Yeah, fair enough. But this is the first... He goes down into the ship, right? And then he's down under the ship, under the water. But then he goes down into the water and he goes down to the bottom with the fish. It's this constant descent down into the abyss. Mm -hmm. And for the ancient Hebrews, who are a desert people, I've talked about this on the show before. Oh, yeah. They were horrified by the ocean <laughs> because, as they noted, there be monsters. Again, it's bigger than me. There's stuff in there that I can't control. It's monster soup. And ultimately, since it's out of my control and it was there before me, 
it's just best if we don't go there. Uh, I kind of feel that way about flying over the ocean. Right? I feel that way about flying over the desert. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of similar that way. It is. It, it's If we go down, well, that's that. <laughs> I was looking at flight patterns, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But also, um, uh, in correlation, comparing flight patterns to... Did you see how uh, many people were watching Nancy Pelosi's flight yeah, online? Yeah, it was like 30,000 at one point. Speaking of, yeah. Crazy. Uh, undersea cables. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about undersea cables is that there's a, there's a lot of places where there aren't any. Yeah. Where they, they follow they follow the same lines as the flight patterns. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not really sure exactly why, but like the whole, like most of the Atlantic, there's no there's no undersea cables. Mm -hmm. there, and, and we don't fly that way either. Because hmm. there's, there's no reason to. Right. Um, some of that just has to do with the, the weird jet stream stuff, I guess. Sure. But, interesting. You know, or Very if you're a flat earther, there might be something there too. There you go. No. There's something but, for everyone at the bottom of the ocean. Right, but I was looking at it. It's like, no, there's whole sections of the ocean that it's just like, no, we're not going to put a cable there. It's and, a dead it, zone, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe there's trenches, you know, mm -hmm. an undersea trench or something that gets in the way. I don't know. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we haven't really we haven't really explored the ocean. True. It's very true. So screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room and the ship healing over toward the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flame and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room. Though in truth infallibly straight itself, it but made obvious the false lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah. As lying in his berth, his tormented eyes roll round the place. And this thus far successful fugitive finds no re refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, and the side are all awry. Ugh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans. Mm -hmm. Straight upwards, so it burns, but the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. What a beautiful description. The, ship the is room tilted. is like a reflection of his own heart. Yeah. Well, just yeah. in the sense of like, this is you, my friend. <laughs> as much as you want to think that you're upright, you're crooked. Hmm. Like one who after a night of drunken revelry hies to his bed, still reeling but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse, but so much the more strikes his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be passed. And at last, amid the whirl of woe, he feels, a deeper stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death. For conscience is the wound, and there is not to staunch it. So, after sore wrestling in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep down again yeah more down 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 i, I keep wondering when is he going to get to the point <laughs> right i, I know about that too it's, it's a, beautiful it's a, but flowery at this point yeah right well i mean he's just telling the story right it's like well you could have just read the text for him or we could just and, sing and that and hymn again i mean the hymn kind of nailed it yeah and the hymn did i'm and I, yeah but i get it i get it i mean there's it seems to be a place you've talked about this with um um you know bible um uh, not just straight up translations but you know, like the message. Mm -hmm. Paraphrases. Paraphrase, where it's trying to, I don't I want to say expand upon it. Catch uh, the spirit not, of the letter. Yeah, exactly. And I spirit think that's what text. he's trying to do here in yeah. a narrative way. Yeah. I mean, every, I think, you know, good preachers, at least, um, and maybe every preacher to some degree, um, is a storyteller. I we hope are so. trying to, yeah, that we are trying to tell stories. I'm mean, mm -hmm. not just like abstract stories, but actually your story. I think, too, though, about you. because my professor was a storyteller, but as he explained it, if you don't come from a storytelling tradition, a storytelling culture, mm -hmm. then you don't, you don't have that in you. Mm. I come from a long line of BSers, storytellers. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I've known people who've grown up in the city, for example, in a very sterile suburban environment, and they're not storytellers. My wife's one of them, actually. Like, she didn't grow up in that culture, so she doesn't know. She's a terrible storyteller. She just is, and she admits it. 
And yeah, like I said, you can call it. But she read books for the kids or something like that, or yeah, I mean, but primarily. They're, they're, that's, but she yeah. doesn't create the story. Right? But she's not the one to tell the story, right? And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is to the point that in the past, stories were how you communicated moral lessons, again, mm-hmm. fairy tales, parables, um, Aesop's fables. Like you were, you had to be a good storyteller because you were educating and teaching through story, through narrative. Whereas nowadays, back to the uh, previous point, everything's so clinical, everything's so quote unquote scientific and objective right. Right. that the illusion of ob- objectivity has essentially kind of beaten the storytelling tradition out of us as a culture. Yeah, you mentioned Davy Jones' Locker. I think that's mm-hmm. an example of where, you know, if you were, a, a, you know, somebody training to be a sailor, or a new sailor, yeah. and, and they said, well, let me tell you, you know, here's what could happen to you, and they just right. described it in purely clinical detail. Mm-hmm. I don't know that you would take it that all that seriously. I mean, no. you would, but it'd just be a data point, right? right. Whereas right. if they told you the story, Davy Jones Locker and it has this whole like mythological, mm-hmm. you know, mystical kind of character to it. Right, hundred percent. Like, okay, now I I do need to be have a realistic right. fear of right. of the sea. Right. Right. And to the sermon, then, when they go on the ship, they all go down below decks into their own berths to sleep. Mm-hmm. They're all together usually in the same, you know, area, the galley or whatever it's called. But they're all going to have to go through this experience very soon. So it's not just that he's speculating, not just that he's going on a long time. He's walking them through step by step what they themselves are about to experience. And they know this because they're all whalers. They're all seasoned veterans Mm -hmm. of the sea. But for him to walk them back through it again to say, like, Jonah went through this and look what God did for Jonah. And you're going to do exactly what Jonah did. It's just that your sin is the sin of not obeying God's command. Oh, wait, that's just like Jonah too, as a matter of fact. And so you, when you, if you should die at sea in your sin and your disobedience, guess what? God will still find you and he will still bring you back. Yeah, maybe the other aspect here too is, is you know, through the narrative of the, mm-hmm. of the sermon, through the, or at least the retelling of the story of Jonah. Yeah. Um, you know, something that we, I suppose we struggle with a little bit is to communicate that, you know, the stories of the Bible and the way the stories mm-hmm. are told, mm-hmm. they are... They're meant to be in, inherently personal. Like, like, right. I know you can't always identify with every character and every story. That's fine, mm-hmm. but but there is something about um, recognizing that that there's you know <laughs> there's right. no experience that isn't common to man that you know right no hundred percent th- that we have right. That's why I laugh when I read Judges. <laughs> it's true. I think I think it's hilarious because what? Why am I laughing? Because I recognize aspects of my own choices mm-hmm. in them. Like right. Barack saying, hey, Deb, can you uh, come with so that God's with us? And you're like, oh, 100% we've done that. <laughs> like 100% we were like, oh, when I'm around this person, I feel closer to God. We mm-hmm. all do it. Right. But we don't like to admit it. And then when it's done narratively, it's disarming. We can laugh at ourselves. We can laugh into the darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that's young Goodman right. Brown does. Right. So now the time of tide has come. The ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf, the uncheered ship of Fort Tarshish, all careening, glides to sea. There that ship, there my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. That's a nice twist on it. <laughs> but the sea rebels, he will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on. The ship is like to break. But now when the boat swain calls, all hands to lighten her. When boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard. When the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head. In all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps his hideous sleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers and little, hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty wail which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Hmm. Wait, isn't the galley where they keep the food and prepare the food? What's the place? Yeah. Somebody on the live stream, somebody tell me what the <laughs> I area is. I wasn't going to correct the... you because I don't Why know. Not? <laughs> somebody, I mean, this is the internet. Somebody's going to know what that area is called under the ship where the sailors sleep. Yeah. Help me. Help me, Obi-Wan. I know it's probably been done before, but just, you know, the compare contrast between Jonah and then Christ asleep in the stern. Right. Yeah. You know, whereas uh, in, the, in the sermon reminds me that there's a detail that's different, right? Is that he's inside the boat, whereas Jesus is, he's mm. out in the, you know, he's sleeping, you know, but it, 
but it's in it's an open right. boat, right? It's a it's a fishing right. vessel, so right. it's not a large one either. So, you know, there's Jonah's still hiding even in his sleep, and it's kind of a sleep of death too, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers, and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale, which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Aye, shipmates Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. A berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him and shrieks in his dead ear. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. To your point. What yep. meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise. Startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet and stumbling to the deck grasps a shroud to look out upon the sea. But at that moment he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks. Wave after wave thus leaps into the ship and finding no speedy vent, runs roaring fore and aft till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat. And ever as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead, aghast, Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beat downward again toward the tormented deep. So this is what we just read in Young Goodman Brown, how all of nature turns against him. Oh, yeah. Is that... This also part of the gothic horror, because I keep quoting O. Henry, uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. You look at Poe and how, again, all of nature, let's just go read The Raven, for example. Yeah, so I was thinking The Raven in particular. Is all of nature, all of creation is turning against you. The walls cry out. and yeah. Yes. And what are we to do then? If the entire world is against you, it's one thing to run away from God to escape your environment. But if all of nature is against you, and you can drown while standing on the deck of the ship. What hope is there? Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, we've talked about it um, off air quite a bit. I think we've mentioned it here too, though. We don't typically preach creation this way. It's again that optimism that comes out of moralistic therapeutic deism that nature is so beautiful, and that the book of nature is such a um, opulent and magnificent thing. Yeah. Versus the way he describes it, which is, it's going to kill you, man. Yeah, certainly, well, we were talking about this with um, Daily Bread, right? Mm -hmm. With the Lord's Prayer yeah. with the kids this week. And, uh, you well, know. You and I have been talking about it a lot the last couple of weeks because. Right. Well, yeah, literally. People but, pray it and don't meditate on it. Um, but Daily Bread, like, it, it doesn't, Luther and his explanations doesn't quite do the same thing with it. Because mm -hmm. um, you have, like, the good and gracious will, right? Yeah, and and there's a lot of grace in every you know, which is only comes from the scripture ultimately. I think, as far as being revealed, like is nature all that gracious? I mean, it is a gift, right, mm -hmm. to us. Um, but <laughs> all creation fell with Adam. But right, it all creation's groaning with uh, birth pangs until now, yeah. right? Jesus says. So God is good, but mm, nature. Right, right. So, uh, you know, the very thing that might be a blessing to you today could could kill you tomorrow. Hundred percent. Right. You no. Know? This uh, happened last Sunday, by the way. We were it? reading Malachi. <laughs> no, we were reading Malachi, and it kind of segued into Lord's Prayer because, again, we were meditating mm -hmm. on that. And <clears throat> be, oh, I know what it was. In Malachi, God says He's basically going to stop the weather. He's going to stop the okay. rain from coming. And I referenced, you know, going back to Elijah. Yeah. And. I said, right now we're going through this drought. Apparently, it's actually drier this year than it was in 2021, a year ago. Even though it doesn't seem like that, apparently it's been drier this year. Well, there's year. other news items that have been taking our Correct. attention, I suppose. Yeah. So I noted, though, that God says, <clears throat> pray, pray, pray for rain. Elijah prayed for rain. Here I got a rain says, stick. Right. Uh, that's not so, what So pray for rain, right? Guess what happened after church? It rained over my house. I texted my elder. It was by, I said, hey, man, look what prayer gets you. He goes, it's not raining here. <laughs> It's only raining where you're at. Huh. And I looked on the weather radar, and yeah, true enough, there was a small strand of weather that went right over the top of where I live and just kept going east and didn't touch anybody two miles north or two miles south of me. So are you trying to say that like power is just as, or at least close to the same uh, effectiveness? No, I, as I told I... my elder that God likes me better than him. But Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, you can command the chemtrails. That's right. it. That's what I'm saying. 
That's what I'm saying. Okay. I've got a red phone in the bat cave that I use. <laughs> but um, no, I just, I noted that, that all, we don't do that typically. We don't pray for God to, again, bring us our daily bread through good weather. Yeah, yeah. We have it in our hymnody, though, that, that yes. you know, to pray in springtime and then harvest. Right. And mm-hmm. I, I think in our service book, the unfortunate thing is it's it's usually shoved towards the back under vocation yeah, and, and it's all, civil society. I think society. it's usually, it's made metaphorical anyway. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've wondered about that. I mean, it seems like our, like the prayer of the church has been this way. At right. Least, my whole well, experience to me it it's begs just, the question if the people who edit these hymnals live on farms or around people that work with their hands mm-hmm. because yeah a lot of these hymns you look at them and go this is not this was not written by somebody who works in the dirt with their hands right right or maybe it was but then it was edited and pushed out of the hymnals over time yeah it just it just seems to be less what do you want to say more abstract i guess or um, just less metaphorical real. yeah it's not yeah. as it's not as dirty mm-hmm. right whereas this sermon is it's wet because he intends it to be wet he, it's it's we're coming the sermon is he's preaching us down mm-hmm. right so again <clears throat> it may be wordy but he's he's literally leading us through a yarn it's not it's said. really i mean for the context it's really not that long no it's actually very short for the context <laughs> right so terror upon terror is running run shouting through his soul. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. In all his cringing attitudes, the God fugitive is now too plainly known. God fugitive, isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. The sailors mark him. More and more certain grow their suspicions of him. And at last fully to test the truth by referring the whole matter to high heaven. They all outward to casting lots to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon them. We'll roll dice. That'll, you know, we'll throw the bones. That'll tell us who, who's responsible for this. The lot is Jonah's. That discovered, then how furiously they mob him with their question, what is thine occupation? Whence comest thou, thy country? What people? But mark now, my shipmates, the behavior of poor <laughs> Jonah. The eager mariners, but ask him who he is and where from. Whereas they not only receive an answer to those questions, but likewise another answer to a question not put by them, but the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. That's from the psalm. Your hand was heavy upon me. So the confession is forced, right, um, out of him, I guess. Well, and and like you said, it's Psalm thirty-two-four. Yeah, it's done. It's done through nature. Yes, right. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's, you're right. Maybe it's because we don't live on the land, generally mm-hmm. speaking. Um, I don't. I've, I don't know. I've what heard it, this in conversations I've had. You've been a part of some of these conversations where someone said to me or when we were in a group, um, "But there is mercy and grace in nature." And I went, "Are you out of your mind? Have you ever been in the woods?" I mean, there's beauty, but it's that awful, terrible beauty. I was going to say, it's terrible beauty because it's beauty until you realize I'm lost or you hear something thumping through the underbrush mm-hmm. or a storm. Like hmm. I've been on, yeah, I've been in situations where storms came in and you're out on a lake. Yeah. And your first thought is lightning. Like that's your first thought. If you grew up around lakes like I did, you get off lakes in storms because you realize one, they come in quick and two, if it's a lightning storm, if you thunder, you motor off that lake. Yeah, the, uh, the two, two people died from that lightning strike in uh, yeah. Washington, well, D.C. yesterday. Uh, you're in open water in an aluminum boat. <laughs> like, like, and, oh, and you have a rod. It, but that just goes, it, just, it just goes through into the ground. Right, exactly. That's what it does. I mean, it okay. fries you on the way, but what? the point is, where I grew up at in the, on the Iron Range and up in northern Minnesota where lots of lakes, lots of fishing, Every summer, someone died on a lake from drowning because the boat capsized. And right. that's another thing you don't realize. When a boat capsizes, like I know people who drowned because they got hit in the head by the boat or an oar oh, okay. and knocked unconscious, or they got trapped under the boat and they couldn't get out. Like There's all kinds of different ways to die on open water. I've been in the ocean and seen fins, you know, dorsal fins pop up and you're like, is that a dolphin or a shark? And your brain's like, doesn't matter. Swim. No. <laughs> 
Let's not no, wait but, to find out. But I mean, you're you're emphasizing the point here is that it's these stories that we tell that actually right. create uh, sometimes unreasonable. But I think sure. I think you know if the, if it's done with good intent, mm-hmm. it's create a reasonable fear so right. that you act with responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The hard hand of God. And also to your point then, according to the Psalms, all of our confession is forced out of us by God. <laughs> yes. We don't actually willingly, to quote Rod Rosenblatt, we don't gladly, happily, wholeheartedly confess our sins. We half acidly confess mm-hmm. our sins against our will because we are being pressed upon by the heavy hand of God. Right. There's no gospel at this point. Um, no. Oh, we're waiting. But... <laughs> we'll watch waiting. for it. I am a Hebrew, he cries, and then I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah. Aye, well mightest thou fear the Lord God then. Straight away he now goes on to make a full confession, whereupon the mariners become more and more appalled, but still are pitiful. For when Jonah, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts. When wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that for his sake this great tempest was upon him, they mercifully turned from him and seek by other means to save the ship. But all in vain. The indignant gale howls louder, and then with one hand raised, invokingly to God, with the other, they not unreluctantly laid hold of Jonah. And now, behold Jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. When instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east, and the sea is as Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind. He goes down in the whirling heart of such a masterless commotion, that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops, seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him. Well, there it is, masterless commotion. Who's in charge down here? Nobody, sir. (laughs) It's chaos. (laughs) Or so it seems. And the whale shoots to all his ivory teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly, but observe his prayer and learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what mm-hmm. is evil in your sight. He I leaves all yeah, he leaves all his deliverance to God, contending contenting himself with this, that spite of all his pains and pangs, he will still look toward his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance. Not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin, but I do place him before you as a model for repentance. Sin not, But if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. Um, All right. So what's the basis for Jonah's repentance? He's going to die and or the fact that he can't. (laughs) Okay. I mean, what is he? I understand what he's repenting, I I guess, from, right? Right. Um, From sin and death. His disobedience, right? He's repenting. What What is he repenting towards? Right. God, kill me. I deserve death. Like, just finish it. Well, right. Is that really repentance? <laughs> well, in I mean, Psalm it's sorrow. It, it's I mean, contrition. It's certainly David, contrition. Well, yeah, but even David in Psalm 51 says, you're just in your judgment of me. Mm-hmm. And don't take your spirit from me. Right? right. Don't turn your face. Don't kill me. Don't right. let me die. Right. This is, I guess this is kind of like the repentance of the prodigal son, right? Well, 100%. It's a forced repentance because the heavy hand of God is upon him. Right, but he can't. He can't even Jonah. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, the preachers. Well, it's I important think to know. Yeah, in the, the in all four chapters of the book, he never actually repents. 
Mm, that's that's kind of my point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he at, at dies the the, and the Lord right. delivers him. Right. But Jonah begs God to kill him after Nineveh repents mm-hmm. and right. receives the promise. Like Nineveh right. repents for like realsies. Like it's all evangelical repentance. Right. Jonah's like, really? Really? We're going to, this is how this is going to end? Really? Just kill me. And God's like, no, dude. I'll kill you when I'm ready to kill you, not because you demand mm-hmm. it. So, right, no, right. he never repents. So, never use Jonah as an example of Christian piety. That's that's what I'm struggling with here. It's yeah, no, like, he's not an example of piety. He's an example of unrepentance. And right. again, these are sailors. These are whalers. These are rough, rugged, brutal men. And I guarantee you, when they're not out at sea, they're doing stuff that rough, rugged, sinful men do, just like the farmers and machinists and others in my congregation like when they roll into church on sunday morning and you smell it Mm -hmm. right it's not shocking i'm not saying it's good and i don't condone it but at the same time i'm thankful you're in church right you know and actually i want you to drink extra communion wine so it makes you sick and you throw up afterwards because then maybe you'll repent maybe then you'll learn your lesson yeah so i mean this is this is the problem with the sailor, right? I mean, what's going to mm-hmm. be what's going to be the purpose of this repentance? Is right. it going to change their life at all? No, no. So what is it? Is it? It's just a sorrow over sin. Okay, mm-hmm. that's I, I mean that's a, well. Certainly what's the part theology of it. behind it, though? Again, is it progressive? Is it that repentance? It's repent and believe. So can mm-hmm. you believe if you don't first show your repentance? Is it the fact that what you're about to do? is horrible, it's terrible. And therefore, you need to prepare for the fact that you're not going to die a noble death. You're not going to die a quote-unquote saint doing saintly, martyr-like things. This is, this is not a glorious death. I can't remember. Does the preacher is, go on the boat with them? I don't did, think Did they so. have a preacher on the boat? I can't no, remember if they did. No, they didn't because uh, in the newer one where Gregory Peck, who was Ahab in the original one, plays the preacher in the newer one with uh, Patrick Stewart... Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that this is the only time we ever meet the preachers yeah. before they set sail. Because it, it's all hidden God from there on out. There's yeah, no, no, there's there's no, no preacher. Re- there's no yeah. preacher. Right. But again, like we, we've posited, was there ever really a preacher for these people in the way that we mean it? Or was it mm-hmm. always this? That repentance was the thing. It wasn't about the evangelical faith. It wasn't about the gospel. It wasn't about baptism or the gifts. It was, and it wasn't, certainly wasn't. Well, those were made obedient, like dutiful, right? um, You know, things that we do, right? But, and it wasn't the passivity of the sinner in the hands of the Holy Spirit. It was sinners (laughs) in in the the, angry God, yes. It was the sinners in the hand of the angry God, like he says, like a spider hanging from a single strand of webbing pinched between the fingers of the one holding him above the fire. (laughs) So, yeah, you need to repent because this is your God and he will kill you. And so he might, so he might spare you. So as a counterposition in on the freedom of the Christian man, Martin Luther says that God uses all of creation, even Satan himself, to participate in the salvation of the individual sinner. Which was always a profound statement to me. That yeah. no matter what state my faith is, as far as my disobedience and hard-heartedness, no matter what the state of the people around me is, God will compel all of his creation, the sun, the grass, the fish, the birds, people, Satan himself, when he, and I wrote about this, um, a Christian satanic comfort a couple years ago, that when Satan shows up to tempt you, thank God, because if he, you're not a Christian, he doesn't show up for you. Satan doesn't tempt those who don't believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior. So when Satan right. shows up to tempt you, at the very least say, thank you, Satan, for reminding me that I am a baptized child of God. Now, we got to deal with you, you loudmouth. Yeah, drop your ugly accusation. Exactly. Right. So... Maybe if you or I were to write this, we would end with that, that, but do not fear sailors because lest you sink to the bottom of the ocean, God will be there for you and he will rescue you in spite of your disobedience. Right, and right, re- right. And, and never mind death and water. And should you not repent? In one story, right? Well, should you not repent as you get hauled over the side of the ship and drugged to your death? Even if you don't repent in that moment, God will still be faithful to his promise to you. Mm -hmm. Versus you better be repentant when you get on that ship. (laughs) (laughs) So while he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without 
seemed to add new power to the preacher, who, when describing Jonah's sea storm, seemed tossed by a storm himself. I can relate. His deep chest heaved as with a groundswell. His tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away from off his swarthy brow, and the light leaping from his eye, made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. Do you remember the um, church? I think it's actually named after Jonah. Um, in Europe, where the pulpit mm -hmm. is like the fish? Yeah, it's an open mouth. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Every once in a while, I bring that back out and show it to my Bible study group. Yeah, it's amazing. It's an yeah, amazing I mean, it's pulpit. beautiful. Yeah. I think our friend uh, Paul Koch um, went there, and he actually stood in the pulpit. There's a lot of pictures of it. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Images of Jonah pulpit. Uh, this, uh, d okay, I'm going to try to find an article. Cool. There now came a lull in his look as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more. And at last, standing motionless with closed eyes for the moment, seemed communing with God and himself. But again, he leaned over towards the people and bowing his head lowly with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility he spake these words. I like that. Manly humility. There we go. It's uh, the this. church. The church is, I don't mm -hmm. know. I have to try to pronounce this. Go. It's it's in Poland. It's oh, Lower Silesia. Good for you. <laughs> there's, there's too many consonants, and they're not the ones I... Duznizgi <laughs> Zraj, or something like that. So I'll post a link to this story. But yeah, it's this whale on the wall, and you, you the preacher stands in the in the fish's mouth. Nice. It's Yeah, no, it's pretty profound. Here we go. Okay. Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you. Both his hands press upon me. I have read ye but what murky light may be mine, the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners, and therefore to ye, and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than ye. And now... How gladly would I come down from this masthead and sit on the hatches there where you sit and listen as you listen, while someone of you reads me that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to me as a pilot of the living God. Well, it's always good to end a sermon talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. How being an anointed pilot prophet or speaker of true things and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of a wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission and sought to escape his duty and his God by taking ship to Joppa. But God is everywhere. Tarshish, he never reached. As we have seen, God came upon him in the whale and swallowed him down to living gulfs of doom and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the seas where the eddying depths sucked him 10,000 fathoms down. And the weeds were wrapped about his head, and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet even then, beyond the reach of any plummet, out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then God heard the engulfed, repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea, the whale came breaching up toward the warm and pleasant sun and all the delights of air and earth and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. When the word of the Lord came a second time and Jonah bruised and beaten his ears like two seashells, still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding and what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, this is that other lesson. And woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. I almost verbatim said this last week to somebody. <laughs> I actually did. I'm like, you know, actually I said, God damn the pastor who turns a blind eye to the living God and the truth. Yeah. Well, and that because, is part of the story of Jonah. I mean, <laughs> right. But it's something that I've started including in my sermons the last couple of months, the mm -hmm. word living. Oh, because okay. I've noted people don't seem to believe that God is 
living. They treat them like a totem pole. Well, and they treat the word as as, as like right. old or dead. Or, well, it's a figment you know. of their imagination or a figment of these old timers' imaginations back then. But as I note in Bible study, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Terrible in the modern sense and terrible in the old sense. It's a terrible yeah. thing. Reminds me of that article I, I, I posted in, um, I think I posted in Telegram about, um, you know, this argument. It was an opinion piece, I think New York mm-hmm. Times or something, right? About um, arguing for like a new kind of atheism, which I just mm-hmm. laughed. Yeah, because... that, was, that was a phenomenal article. Well, so well, well it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But um, it was but, a dog whistle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, but I do think it's helpful to hear these kind of, these kind of folks mm-hmm. is like, okay, if I'm going to reject the God of the scriptures, mm-hmm. what am I left with? Well, quote unquote atheism, which I think is ironic. I think it, maybe mm-hmm. I even said this it, um, in some context, right? Is that the Romans accused Christians of being atheistic. Atheist, Why? Right? Yeah. Because they were monotheistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas, you know, what was the, what was the argument there? It wasn't actually atheism. It was like, you know, this fear and, and mm-hmm. trust in all sorts of gods, yeah. right? They just don't go by the name yeah. of gods. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and I think I think it's for this reason is that mm-hmm. is that these are things that are, you know, close by, they're at hand. Right. Um, and so they have that sense of being alive. Or at least we can I, we can I animate hope them. That what is happening, I think it's gonna be a generation yet before it really takes hold though. But I think what's happening is that nihilists are starting to recognize the meaninglessness, the valueness, mm. the lack of a higher calling, a higher goal, a higher thing, yeah. is really what at at root is the problem for them and with their group or their culture. Is yeah. that I don't really have anything other than the yes or no of my own personal tastes, my craving. Well, we've and we've made the argument, and I think um, others have as well that. Someone like Jordan Jordan Peterson is is appealing for that right. very reason. Is that yeah. it's not yes, it's not all that theological, um, but it you know why do young men in particular right? He talks about at length yeah. you know are attracted to him because he's like be a man. He actually gives them he says something You're before right. them, when and you're he being does culturally it, castrated every day. Right, it, he sets something before them that that they can be first yes. and foremost that they maybe that they already are, right. but like you said, are being castrated. Um, and it's something to strive for and to and to improve, and that right. you know that it has meaning and purpose. Yeah, right. Uh, I I asked this. <laughs> we're we're watching a TV show. Um, I don't know if you recommended it to me. It's um, Counterpart. It was on Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. but it was originally on yeah. Stars. Right? Yeah, the and first season's t- fantastic. The okay. Second season is terrible. Don't watch it. Okay, we're in the first season. It goes uh, super woke in season two. No, of course it does. The <laughs> But 2018, obviously, there's all sorts of contextual mm-hmm. things that are very interesting, like yes. uh, pandemic and mm-hmm. masking and hand washing. Yeah. Isn't and... it weird? You watch that, and you're like, because I watched it in 2020. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait, this is a little on the nose. Anyway, so so I mean, part of the part of the challenge of the show is that you've got these two parallel timelines, but the characters mm-hmm. are interacting with each other and they're right. tr- transversing between these two timelines. And so it's hard to know where you are at any given moment. Exactly. Like, are they yeah. on their side or on their side? Which I think is actually intentional um i don't know i'm only about halfway in but i, right. well, I think it's the in- season yeah it is um it's just th- i think it's to throw you off like you said narratively you're like mm-hmm. which one's the real one wait they're both real so right exactly no, yeah. right but then the, but then the the two versions you know where the the person div, uh, div, mm-hmm. diverts from each other right on their yeah. timeline right they're really not different right mm-hmm. they made different choices but they're really not different people right yep it, right, right. Had there been a third season, I think that's the direction they were going is to kind of draw out the fact to that, merge it. Well, they yeah, like you're the same person at heart. It's just mm-hmm. that in these different worlds, life worked out differently. He's got a new one now. And things. J.K. Simmons, his new one on Amazon is called Night Sky. Oh yeah, I saw that. Maybe and, that was uh, the one I intended to watch. It's actually I don't very know. similar in the sense of I haven't watched it yet. I just saw the trailer, but there's a door in their basement that goes somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so we're watching the show, and I ask Ann afterwards, and she's mm-hmm. she's like, I'm like, I always pick the kind of same kind of shows, don't you? Right? Uh, and she's like, Yeah, mm-hmm. you do. I'm like, Aren't these questions interesting to you? These questions yeah. of like meaning and existence mm-hmm. and purpose? And she's like, Nope. <laughs> no, no. I think I'll just have another baby. I'm like, oh, Yeah. Okay then. <laughs> right. 
I mean, it's in. Do I get a participation I, thing? Do I get a vote or? No, and I and so I, but I wonder if it isn't to this point in that, mm-hmm. um, is that you don't have the same assault on femininity that you do on masculinity Correct. in our current setting. Sure. Right, and so Good that point. meaning and purpose it's being drawn mm-hmm. out, um, and, and that whereas women are, f- in a sense, still free to be women, although there's some still mockery, chest feeding, and you know, mm-hmm. menstruating people and all mm-hmm. things of trying to diminish or minimize. Um, you know, womanhood, but, right. um, but there is something about, you know, it, there does seem to be a more masculine existential crisis than there does to seem to be a right. feminine one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although the, I, I suppose women that put themselves in, in more, I guess, stereotypically masculine roles are finding themselves in those kind of crises, like voluntary mm-hmm. childlessness until later in life. And they're yeah. like, well, no, I can't have children. And right. who was it that that was the creator of, uh, sex in the city. I think mm-hmm. she came right. out and said like, I wish I had had children. Right. You know, didn't realize that until she was past you know childbearing age. Well, again, you have no no meaning, no value, no higher thing. Mm-hmm. What do you do with the space? What do you do with the time? What do you do with your mental energy? Well, and and it is you know, I, so I've thought about this with like classic kind of literature. We talk about it with farmers. You could do it here with the whalers, though. Mm-hmm. It's like they're they're not having those kind of crises. No, like Every am day I really them is yeah. Yeah, am I really a person? Am I really a man? What's the point mm-hmm. of life? You know, what's right. the purpose? The authors, right. the author does, mm-hmm. but the characters, they're just like I'm just doing my job, and that's and they're content with that. There's a contentedness, mm-hmm. and I, I don't know what what the malaise is that the or even disease that we're suffering from, you know, where we're just not we're just not content people. Um, well, because you know, because we're privileged and we live in luxury. Mm. And so, so we don't have to strive of, for anything. Exactly. We're so entitled because we have the luxury to be entitled. Mm. Our poor people are fat. Like I've lived <laughs> in third world countries. With cell phones and satellite dishes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, these men don't have to be told what it means to be a man because they do it every day. They're men mm-hmm. and the women are women and they have a set of values that are based on God's word and they have a higher thing they serve, thus the sermon. And they do something for the good of their whole village, their whole community, right? which is extremely dangerous. So they don't need to be lectured on what it means to be a man. What they need to be told is in the process of doing man things, masculine things, you could die. And Which, which I, they know, but they're, but they're not maybe thinking about it in a um, spiritual way. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. as I've learned, and, and I'm sure you have, those who are... Those who work with their hands are so grounded in physical creation, material creation, Mm -hmm. everything's material, that really then the metaphysical, they have the questions, but maybe they just don't know how to phrase it or ask it or express it, or it's just not acceptable for a man to say these things out loud, to ask these questions. And so as a preacher, you, you learn how to suss out the confession, you listen for the confession very attentively, and then you use their own language to bring the metaphysical into the physical. This is thus the living God. Where is the living God present for you? In the bread, in the wine. You can touch it. It's tangible. It's graspable. Yeah. In the water. You can come and find me. I'm your preacher sent by the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm available. I'm graspable. They need that realness because their entire world is so real, they can't escape it. Versus you see people who have escaped the reality of the world. They're on TV. <laughs> Right. And they're, you know, it's, yeah, anyways, don't want to go off on a tangent on that, but you see people so detached from reality that they say things that make normal people who work every day scratch their head and go, what? I thought of an analogy. Can you imagine if they tried to like re, uh, recast and reset the, um, the first Matrix movie um, <sighs> in a farm community? Right. Oof. The, the people right. would be like, I mean, they wouldn't have mm-hmm. fallen for the original. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole problem. It's like, it wouldn't work. You have no. to be a city dweller. You have to be yes. a cubicle, right. you know, worker. Yeah, a drone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. to have forfeited that much right. of your humanity to be Correct. able to, to live under the mm-hmm. simulation. Go watch City of uh, City of Men with Clive Owen about the, mm-hmm. yeah. the, the pregnant woman. Go watch that. Because that's pretty much the way things would work out, in my opinion. If yeah. if there were an apocalyptic or catastrophic event, that's kind of the way it would work itself out. Because the people in the cities would just lock themselves in cities. And the people out in the country would figure it out. 
Mm -hmm. and, and then some might even start yeah. a new civilization. Somewhere. Right, exactly. And just keep to themselves. New community, new culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be grand. So this shipmates, this is that other lesson. And woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Well, could you get to it? Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true even though to be false were salvation. Yes, woe to him who is the great pilot Paul has it, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others is himself a castaway. Hmm. He drooped and fell away from himself for a moment. Then lifting his face to them again showed a deep joy in his eyes as he cried out with a heavenly enthusiasm. But, oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe, there is a sure delight. And higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. Is not the main truck higher than the Kelson is low? Delight is to him a far, far upward and inward delight, who against the proud gods and commodores of this earth ever stands forth his own inexorable self. Delight is to him whose strong arms yet support him, when the ship of this base, treacherous world has gone down beneath him. Delight is to him who gives no quarter in the truth and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. <laughs> Oops, over the target. Mm -hmm. <laughs> delight, top gallant delight, is to him who acknowledges no law or Lord, but the Lord his God and is only a patriot to heaven. Delight is to him whom all the waves of the billows of the seas of the boisterous mob can never shake from this sure keel of the ages. <laughs> and eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who coming to lay him down can say with his final breath, O Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee, for what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? Uh, okay. Um, by the way, uh, Kelson, you said, mm -hmm. is not the main truck higher than the Kelson is low? Well, yeah. Uh, Kelson. Kelson, a structure running the length of a ship and fastening the timbers or plates of the floor to its keel. Hmm. Right, so so it is the like the lowest part of the ship. It's yeah. that long piece that goes down the center. That yeah, yeah. I didn't know it had a word. There's a word it, for that. That I didn't either. Line. I thought it was just yeah the support beam, uh, the keel haul. That's something fun for you listeners to look up, to get keel hauled, under a ship. I think did they do that in Master and Commander? I can't remember. Mm, I don't remember. I should probably watch that again. He said no more, but slowly waving a benediction, covered his face with his hands. His face with his hands. And so remained kneeling till all the people had departed and he was left alone in that place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a great reception to that sermon. <laughs> so, again, broken record on these parables, these I know. stories. Well, and uh, also no when gospel. we do sermon reviews. Yeah, he didn't mention the gospel. We'll give him credit for mentioning yeah, what, the gospel. What was the context of it, though? The world charms from gospel duty. I think he means gospel in the broadest sense. Right? Yes, he Just does. Yeah, the preaching yeah. of the word yeah. of God. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, not in the I forgive you sense, because there is no forgiveness in this sermon. No, this well, is, the, the, yeah. the God that you meet, O oh Father, who's known to, chiefly known to me by thy rod. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there you go, by the law. Which is true. I'm not saying it's not true. It's 100% true, actually, in my according opinion. According to nature? Absolutely, yeah. Well, just according to my experience. Yeah, I suppose that's true, too. I suffer God's rod way more than his absolution because, one, I'm a preacher. I don't have a preacher. And number two, uh, that happens once a week for most people. Whereas the other six days, well, technically seven days minus one or two hours, it's just weight. It's the cross on your shoulders, day in, day out. It's like... 
this is a very benign example, but it comes to mind just to kind of explain the exasperation. So we've had this heat wave the last month. So my dogs have been waking up every two hours to go outside. Climate During, change. So we've given them Benadryl. We've given them CBD. We've made sure that they don't drink before we, you know, put them away for the night. All these different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Every two hours, midnight, two, four. I get up with them, but I sleep really hard. So usually it's my wife who gets up. She's wrecked. She is absolutely wrecked. She's almost to the point where she's crying when she wakes up in the morning because she's sleeping in two-hour shifts like she has a baby. Right, exactly. And so my dogs, whom she loves unconditionally, she would never do anything to her to harm them. She just prays, literally prays out loud, God, let me sleep for an entire night two days in a row. That's the rod. That's the rod she experiences. Now, if I remind her, well, you're the one who wanted the second dog. <laughs> that's just the rod. That's just another last That's more rod. rod. Yes, that's more rod. <laughs> if, even if I apologize and say, I'm sorry that I sleep so hard that I don't hear the dogs whining. I'm sorry. That doesn't make it better, right? Sorry doesn't make it better. I just want sleep. Like, could you get up with the dogs? Could you? I'm like, I don't hear them. <laughs> like, unless I let them sleep in the bedroom. And which, by the way, when they do sleep in our bedroom, guess which side of the bed they go to? Mm. Hers. They go to her side of the bed because they're afraid of me. <laughs> they know which side the, the bread is buttered on. But it goes to the point of you can love something or someone unconditionally. You can say, like, we do anything for our dogs, let alone our kids. But when it's day after day, hour after hour, that love is a raw. It's a lash. And you cry out to God, God, don't take these things away from me. Don't take these people away from me. But for, for your sake, could you at least give me some relief? Yeah. Just a moment. And it's not there. And then you go to church on Sunday and you hear this sermon. Well, no more. Re there's no relief here either. There's no release valve on any of Nothing. this. Nothing. Not at all. Not no. at all. Just and be, af be afraid, but be afraid, be afraid of the right be thing. Very afraid. Repent. Right. Be sure to repent. Yeah, not 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 simply afraid of the sea or of the beast or something like that. Right. But actually right. of the one who who made and created and sustains both sea and beast. Right. So right. what is the lesson of the sermon then? Other than simply you're going to go out, there's a good chance you're going to die. So get right with your God before it happens. Repent of mm -hmm. your sin. Repent yeah. of your disobedience. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to what they tell you. Why not? Well, because they're not of God. Okay, but what is of God? Well, right. your repentance, right? right. But where's right. Jesus? Where's the Holy Spirit? Where's the gospel? There's no forgiveness of sins. There's no new life. This could be an Ash Wednesday sermon for a lot of preachers. I mean, I was going to say it could almost be just be a Jewish sermon. 100%. Absolutely. Or could even, a, a I Muslim guess, Muslim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it could be. They yeah. would go for this. Pretty much. Well, this could be a Unitarian sermon. This could be anybody who believes in God in a general monotheistic sense. Anybody mm -hmm. could preach this sermon. Okay. And again, like we said, our criteria, the first, the prime criteria for a sermon is, did Jesus have to die for this to be preached? And in this case, the answer is absolutely, in, in my opinion, no. Jesus didn't even have to be born for this sermon to be preached. Well, and that the fact that Jonah is spit out onto the beach... Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, I mean, that is resurrection. It it wouldn't be hard <laughs> to, to go there. An, just to have another sentence or a comma. <laughs> I, exactly. But so then instead what it is, is, is it's just, I guess it's a kind of mercy, mm -hmm. right? But it's, but it's temporary. It's just a temporary mercy. I don't think Melville was a Christian. I'm almost positive. I don't even think he was a Unitarian. Can you look that up? I'm looking what, here. Was he religious or not? Mixed reviews. This, hmm. Doesn't this ring a lot like the trial in a certain sense? Yeah. Just law, 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 law. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Born in North, uh, North New York City. Oh, well, he said he'd dwell there. Third child of a prosperous merchant uh, who le whose death left the family in, f in financial straits. Mm -hmm. He took to sea as a common sailor. Of course he did. Uh, ambition, family, and early life. Let's see. I'm looking. I don't know what we've got here. Oh, here we go. Almost three weeks after his birth, Herman Melville was baptized at home by a minister of the South Reformed Dutch Church. <laughs> Sorry. I shouldn't be laughing. Um, let's see. His grandparent, uh, let's see, Alan. Who's Alan? 
Oh, um, Herman's father was uh, Unitarian, and then his mother was a strict, biblically oriented Dutch Reformed. Oh, there person. you go. <laughs> so you got a mix of Unitarianism and, and Dutch Reformed yeah. Calvinism. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's a recipe. I'm sorry if we have Dutch Reformed listeners, right? But you know what we're talking about. If you're a Dutch Reformed, you know what we're talking about. It's you, uh, yeah, you know. it's intense. Yeah, it, yeah, you know the old all. school ones, the old school ones, not the new ones, the old ones. Wow. And then, of course, then the, his dad died. Um, mm. So I'm sure that was a little bit of a crisis for him, You're right? right? When he was five, no, twelve, when his father died. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. So I mean, that's at least in the background. So familiarity is at least in the background. So many of these guys had either no father figure, some father either died or abandoned them, or they just had a terrible relationship with their father. Mm-hmm. So many of them. It's, it's yeah, remarkable. Maybe that also adds to the gothic horror thing. <laughs> they just, they yeah, just grew up hard. They grew up hard. They grew up estranged from a father. You know, didn't have a father figure, didn't have mentors. Yeah. And what was it that I recognized the other day? I mean, so much of Disney is like there's no parents. Right. Right. Or there's step parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be bad too. Or a mom, but uh, not a dad. Yeah. Right. But then I was thinking about how many films were father and daughter starting mm -hmm. in the 90s. Father, yes. daughter, no mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was a kind of an interesting, interesting dynamic. I don't know mm -hmm. what, what it was. It was th if there was just a lack of stories, you know. That well, that was that actually very of... prevalent in the 70s. When I was a little boy back in the 70s, <clears throat> I was born in 71, um, there were lots of, like, um, Escape to Witch Mountain came to mind because I falsely referenced mm. um, Night on Witch Mountain from Fantasia, the Black Mass. Um, but Escape to Witch Mountain was about two kids, twins, who were aliens, but they were helped by <laughs> a kind old man, yeah. Eddie Albert, right? Like, that used to be a thing. Like, kind old men used to be these kind of savior figures in kids' movies. And no more. No. There's not even really kindly old women in movies nowadays. No. If you think of pop culture, think of Star Wars, think of Star Trek, think of the series, um, think of Marvel, DC. Right? Other than Martha Kent in Superman, like who are the kindly old elders of the of the village the, the elders of the tribe who are there to help us right yeah yeah in fact i yeah. would argue that in pop culture age is actually kind of anathema well maybe that goes back to what we were talking about with um with the tv uh, producer right well in that yeah oh, go ahead no that it's like um whether it's intentional or not i'm not sure but um, mm -hmm. but there does it, it, it's a cultural influence right mm -hmm. and that it's it's just being assertive and, and maybe it resonates with people who have broken homes, mm -hmm. I suppose. I mean, that might be one of the reasons you do sure. it. But it ends up being almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy then. Because mm, right. you, you, you kind of present to children, you know, well, you could be like Peter Pan, right? And you mm -hmm. could live, you know, on your own. Yeah. So, hmm. By Maybe the way, I didn't know that and... Hawthorne had, a, uh, had all sorts of correspondence over Moby yes, Dick. Yes, there's a book you can buy uh, of their letters. Okay. It's good. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I bet you did. Yeah, when I again I worked at Barnes and Noble and receiving, and there was a whole section of the store on one shelf of just letters and correspondence. So like Mozart and his sister, there's a book of letters between Mozart and his sister, which are body. Wow, were they filthy? Um, hmm. Like you're, I'm, I'm like, is this your sister for like reals? Like biologically, because I would never say these things to one of my siblings. Uh -huh. um, and there's one between Melville and um, Hawthorne. There's one again between Dostoevsky and Nietzsche. Like there's a whole genre of these letters that was really popular in the late '90s, early 2000s when I was working there, and I just found them fascinating because again, it, you're you're being let in to a private correspondence between these people that, and they talked about he's writing Moby Dick and the struggles he has writing it and what he's writing it for and why, and Hawthorne talking about what he's writing at the moment and what he's struggling with, and but it's also it captures their it captures society during their lifetime too so it yeah. really paints this beautiful picture like we talked about with ken burns the civil war the pictures and the letters being read over the pictures it just gives you that kind of journalistic man on the street kind of feel same thing with ken burns's jazz very similar mm -hmm. yeah. and so i love that series ken burns's jazz because most of it is in the the words of the musicians themselves and it's not good 
most no. of the time. They did not have easy lives. They didn't have good, like Louis Armstrong learned how to play the trumpet to survive. That's why he was good, because if he wasn't, he would have died. Because he's competing with all the other buskers in New Orleans for dimes and nickels and pennies, and he's playing in juke joints, obviously, and grows up around prostitutes and gambling and drugs. And he gets out of all of that, and the later generation of black musicians called him an Uncle Tom. And he's like, dude, do you know what I had to do to get here? It's a different generation. If I had done, if I had said the things you're saying, I would have been hung. Yeah. So again, historical context matters. So when you get the letters and you get the personal diaries of these people and you find out their real thoughts, the fact that Louis Armstrong hated the fact that he had to smile all the time. He hated that he had to always be on. He hated the fact that he had to hide the fact that he used marijuana 24 seven. Um, he hated all that because he was living two lives, but he had to, to survive and to be successful because that's the generation that he lived in. And you find that out from his letters, but you don't find that out from biographies of him necessarily no. or from pop culture because everybody knows him as it's, you know, it's a wonderful world guy mm -hmm. or somewhere over the rainbow, but you don't know that like, no, he's a real guy and he had demons. Same yeah. thing with Melville, same thing with Hawthorne, same thing with Dostoevsky and Nietzsche and others. Right, and I think, you know, the thing with Melville, maybe it's helpful. I mean, if you think now knowing um, that Unitarian and that Dutch Reformed background, yeah. you know, um, those those end up being almost like demons that haunt him in the, in the writing. Yeah. I mean, he's dealing with, I guess, broadly speaking, predestination from a, mm -hmm. from a Calvinistic viewpoint. Working you know. your way into heaven. Right, or can you escape, you know, what God has yeah. set up, yeah. set in front of you, you know, yeah. certain death, that kind of thing, you know, that double predestination approach. Right. Yeah. And is there a God at all? I mean, that's seems, that seems to be one of the questions, too. Right, right. <laughs> you know, or is it just the whale? So to the point that we brought up in our Hawthorne discussion, I don't think it's that shocking, the number of people who apostatized in, in this time. I mean, imagine just like a, what like a generation later you get the civil war yeah well that too yeah i mean hey things are going to get better and we're going to kill each other no and and that's uh, i've been thinking about this with revolutions you know typically i mean the internet maybe has changed this a little bit but usually usually it is like a 20 to 50 year project yeah you know it takes that kind of long for things it takes that long for right. things to spin out so you know, we might not be looking for a bigger revolution, not be seeing a revolution for another generation yet. Mm -hmm. But oh, it's but coming. Every, but yeah. everything that leads to that, we're experiencing now, right? Yes. And so that, so Melville knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knows whatever whatever the cultural. I don't. I can't even think of like all the things that are happening around that that finally you know boil over mm -hmm. then with with the with the Civil War. Right. Um, but he knows them, right? And they're like demons, you know, to a culture. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no gospel anywhere. That's the problem, though. Where's the gospel? Well, there's Where no the... way out, right? Yeah. This is what I was saying about like repenting towards something. Like if you, and and then you said you like most of your life is under the cross or yeah. under you know under the weight of God. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, you know, unless you're around people who actually you know Preach. pray and and believe yeah. you know the Lord's prayer, for example, right. forgive us, right? As we forgive those says, around right, us. Your rod and your staff come from me. One is law, mm -hmm. one is gospel. Yeah, the rod is usually the thing we feel the most often in the heart. Acutely, yeah, acutely, yeah. and the gospel comes in moments. It comes in, okay, here it is, and as preachers, at least, that's why I feel it's so necessary that we give them the gospel. Right. Well, it might be the only place they ever hear. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Forgiveness. Yeah, hundred percent. Their their spouses, their mm -hmm. children, their mm -hmm. their coworkers, their employers. Right. There's no, for, I, they may not, ex, ex, no. maybe never hear a word of forgiveness, no. or they may never even speak one either. I mean, Correct. <laughs> which doesn't help either. <laughs> right. On the flip well, they side. don't know how to speak it because they're not grounded in God's <laughs> word. They right. don't pray. Um, they're not. The, everyone's theological. You pointed that out in previous episodes. Like we're all theological. Mm -hmm. We all have this knowledge of God that we then use and right. leverage, one right. way or the other. But that's not being grounded in God's word necessarily. <laughs> and you can read God's word and still be grounded there. Uh, same thing with prayer. And so as a consequence, if you if God doesn't send you a preacher to declare the good news to you, and therefore the backspin of like, oh, well, I must have sin that needs to be forgiven. You're just stuck with this. You're stuck with just law. 
Yeah, pray that God just like kind of pulls back a little bit. Right. <laughs> At least when God kills you, he takes you to heaven. Yeah. I got that. It's like, that's so fatalistic. I know. You're probably going to die, but don't worry because if in your dying hour you cry out to God the Father, there's a good chance that he'll take you to heaven. It's like, what did you just say? There's a chance he'll take me to heaven? Well, are you repentant or not? I don't know. I was busy drowning. I wasn't really mm -hmm. thinking about anything other than, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Right. I'm, and then I'm dead. Right. Like, you know. It's like I've seen people die screaming no, right? Just no. And you know exactly what they're saying. I don't want to die. Don't take me. No. And it's like, mm -hmm. is that really the word? That's your final word, and you want to be judged on that? Yeah. Again, it makes me wonder, in Melville's case, since he wrote this, did he hear this? As I said, it's more likely he's based this on a sermon he, he actually heard, because again, yeah. from his letters. But then, I mean... Going back to young Goodman Brown, if you haven't listened to those two episodes, go back and check them out. Why wouldn't you make a deal with Satan in this context? At least he listens. At least he's offering you something. Right, I and mean, there's what, a change. There's a change. And there's a change, an, an actual change, versus this one is, hey, just hope for the best. Really? I might right. have 50 years left, and you want me to hope for the best, and then Satan comes trotting along. Hey, I can give you the best right now. And by the way, when you call, I will always show up. Yeah. I mean, this sermon's kind of on the level of the that that clip. I, I put it on my YouTube page because mm -hmm. I couldn't, I didn't want to have to keep looking for it all the time, but it was from sure. ER and it's the, um, it's, it's Mike, you know, Aaron Trout from, uh, from Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. It's that actor, but, um, he's a, he's a warden who was responsible for lethal injection mm. and he's dying of cancer. I don't, sure. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you seen this? Okay. Maybe I'll have to link to it. Mm. Anyway, he's dying from cancer and then the chaplain lady, um, is like, well, there's all sorts of problems there already. But anyway, she's just like, well, you just need to find a way inside yourself to forgive, you know, to f find a way to forgive yeah. yourself. He's yeah. like, I don't No, That's not what I want. And he gets really mad. He's like, yeah, you know, I need a real preacher that has, mm -hmm. you know, with a real God and real forgiveness. Right. 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 You know, Go watch really, the last really 20 minutes of the green mile to that point. Mm. Yeah. Same idea. Same idea. Right. Like, well, well isn't that, he's kind of gothic, isn't it? I haven't thought about that. Green Mile is very gothic. Yeah. The setting I'm, is very gothic. Yeah. Just uh, who's the writer um, or director? Ah, director. I lost well, it. Well, Stephen King wrote the original story. Mm hmm. I know. And then who directed it? Was it Spielberg? No. Uh, it was Spielberg, I think. Was it Green Spielberg? Mile? Yeah. Let's see. You'll find out. Nope. D Frank Darabont. Who oh, it is Darabont. Right. That's who I was thinking of. Spielberg probably produced it. Okay. Darabont directed. They did a couple projects together. Mm -hmm. um, Most well known for the, the Great or the Walking Dead. But Darabont. Yeah. And uh, but he has that that it's it's well, it's Christ haunted. Right. We've talked mm -hmm. about that yeah. uh, in all of this kind of literature. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it's maybe it's actually just an American thing. <laughs> it's wild, man. It is. To, Broadly to speaking. See such Christless parables, such Christless stories, such Christless sermons, all based on biblical themes. They're theological mm -hmm. through and through, otherwise we wouldn't be reading them, but there's no Christ. Repeatedly. And if there were, you would think then that they would be included because it would be the air they breathe. Right. But it's not there. It's just not there. Same thing with The River Runs Through It by Norman McLean. Because his dad was a Presbyterian minister, and so the language of the Geneva Catechism is just everywhere in that story. Right, and, and I think we should be careful there. I mean, it, um, you know, Reformed Calvinism isn't necessarily gospel-less. <laughs> Correct. Oh, no, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying as an example, though, when you read A River Runs Through It, right. McLean grew up with a Presbyterian minister for a father, so the language of the faith, it just shows up in his writing naturally. Right, but I, what I'm saying is that, you know, even if their catechism or their, their official doctrinal statements, mm -hmm. you know, um, do have, you know, a, a pretty reasonable, you know, confession of the gospel, mm -hmm. it's not in the preaching. Correct, exactly. And that's what I was saying is like, it's all there, the language is there, but mm -hmm. they obviously didn't hear it preached. Right. Because it would have found its way into their narratives. And it, it or maybe it's just a matter of emphasis, right? It's yes. like, it, yeah. Well, you, you know, talk like about our, Jesus, right? They talk about Jesus. Right. Like in yeah. our context, is like if we had a divine service that didn't declare the forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. we would consider that um, a You favorite. and I would. You like, and I would. Yeah. Right. 
right but but like every time right like that must be the, not only there mm -hmm. but also the emphasis it's the reason right. why we're there right whereas you know i think in that context it may be a reason why you're there it right. might be present. Hopefully, it's mm -hmm. present most, you right. know, especially on say Easter or something. Well, right. As going back to your earlier reference, somebody says, "Hey, pastor, how about some more application? Go listen to a Jordan Peterson lecture." Mm -hmm. Right. You'll get all that you need from him. You don't need me for that. You could even do one where he's preaching from the Bible, so to 100%, speak. Hundred percent, because he does. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, right. Quote unquote. Go, preaching. go listen to him talk about Exodus. You'll get all you need as far as application goes. Mm -hmm. Um, might not understand a lot of it when he gets into the union stuff, but the point is, is that there are plenty of other preachers in the world who will give you plenty of homework. Right. And tell you how to live your life in a godly way even. But right. very, what, very introspective mm -hmm. and diagnostic. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. You know, get into Buddhism. There's all kinds of talk of God mm. in the Bhagavad Gita. And death. Um, <laughs> and lots of talk of death. Lots of talk about death. <laughs> um, go read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Lots of talk about God. Egyptian Book of the Dead. Lots of talk about God. Even the Druids talked about God. You can go yeah. read Druidic literature. However, you will never discover Christ in a single page. And therefore, there will be no forgiveness, no new life, and no right. salvation. It's all internal. It's all some journey language. It's all going from point A to point B. It's all escaping material reality and mm -hmm. denying objective reality. Because the old Adam hates God and his creation. Right. And in the end, that sermon is kind of hopeless in that sense because it kind of paints creation. It doesn't kind of. It does paint creation as your enemy. And therefore, God is your enemy. Because his rod and his heavy hand. So, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a conversation we usually like to have. But, like, are any of these sailors going to remember the sermon the next Maybe day or Maybe when they're going down. Yeah, maybe. Um, right. When the storm hits the ship, they'll remember the sermon, and then they'll curse the preacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my point. That's what I would do anyway. I'd curse the preacher because, okay, you told me what's going to happen, and now what? Thanks for the warning. Right? Yeah, I already knew that, though. Right. right. That's, it's just part of the job. Right. So get right with God before you die is essentially what I got out of the sermon. Get right with God before you die. Because if you don't... So this is like the preacher in the... Uh, you know, in the stern of the uh, landing craft at Normandy or something. Yeah, right. Effectively. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they were preaching. I hope there was some gospel there. Well, isn't that at the beginning of Saving Private Ryan? Mm -hmm. There's one of the landing crafts that has a preacher in it, and then yeah. they all get shot. Right. That's the one yeah. I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah. Or Apocalypse Now. Um, after the air cab come in, there's oh, a preacher who sets up an altar, right, um, in the background. But it's always the same. They talk about, and they talk in godly language, and there's godly symbols and images. But other than in Apocalypse Now, there's at least liturgy being said. So there's the, the invocation of Jesus. At least, again, people, I know people give us a hard time sometimes for the, the us, us talking about liturgy. I'm like, the thing about the liturgy is, one, it's time-tested, and, and it's been field-tested in every area of, that you can Multiple imagine. Multiple languages, on, contexts. On this yeah. earth, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and second of all, the reason that we value it is because it preaches Christ. And there's going to be times when I, as a sinner, don't preach Christ. I'm You're going talking to say about the Western some, right, just to be precise Yeah, the Western here. right, sorry. Um, yeah. Specifically the Western right. Eastern right, not so bad, but, you know, again, it, it kind well, of Well, which one are you talking about when it comes to okay, East? That's They're a point little too. less unified, yes. Yeah, but let's say the Greek. Um, that's the one I'm most familiar with. But it, it mm -hmm. floats away. It, it just gets away from you because it's Greek um, and it's part of that tradition. At least the Western uh, tradition um, grounds it a little bit more in the creation and in material things. Right. And of course, we're preferential to the Lutheran Reformation of it. But. A little bit. That's why we're Lutheran <laughs> but, <laughs> um, by conviction. But the mm -hmm. point is then that we appreciate and value those tools. It's just like AA. In Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps, do you need them to be sober? No. Are they a useful tool in sobriety? Absolutely. So is the big yeah. book of AA. Do you need to read the big book and memorize it to be a sober alcoholic? No, of course not. It's just Only the original. Yeah, in the original. But the point being then that these are tools. And the mm -hmm. tools, in my opinion, and, and judged by the church over the years, they're good tools because they are laser focused on the necessary, the essential things, which is Christ crucified for the sin of the world, for sinners. 
And therefore, when you as a pastor fail, and you will, because you're a sinner, the liturgy will be a safety net for your congregation and for you. Because your congregation, I hate to break it to you if you're not a pastor and you don't know this, they're not going to want you to preach Jesus Christ crucified every Sunday. And they're not going to want you to emphasize the gifts. And they're 100% going to attack you and vilify you if you preach that you are perfectly passive in relation to not just your justification, mm -hmm. but your sanctification. Correct. And if you don't have the word of God pointing to Christ, and you don't have that authority, that external authority, they're going to devour you. And they'll still devour you with it, but at least you have it. It's your sword and your shield, so to speak. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Good. So that's what we're after at all times. Critique, show deference, right? Um, he did have one sentence of mercy when he says that, you know, God reached down and made the whale vomit him up on the seashore. He did. That's a good, that's good. But he didn't go anywhere with it. That's where you go, I that's know. where you hit resurrection from the dead to eternal life. Right, because this is death and Instead, resurrection Instead, he started story. talking about yeah. himself, which in my opinion is literally the number one thing you never do in the pulpit. <laughs> is well, talk about and yourself. Then, and then, I mean, the most, I suppose, damning thing is that <laughs> Is that Jesus himself uses the, this story of Jonah to confess his death and resurrection. Right, exactly. I'm going to use this to talk about myself, but I mean, you as a preacher, feel free to just not talk about me and talk about yourself in the spot where I should be given the space. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So it's like, That's, I mean, it wasn't like yeah. you even had to like, you know, get all metaphorical or something and try to figure right. out a way to, right. to shoehorn Jesus into the story. No. It's like Jesus tells you, think, yeah. That's a story about me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty brief thing, right? It's like, it's not, yeah, it's not wordy. It's not, like you said, it's not, I, I don't understand what he's trying to get after. No, he literally is like, this is exactly like, it's about, I'm going to go into the belly of the earth, just like Jonah in the belly of the fish. I mean, he even gives you the metaphor point. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, you don't have Done. to work, work too hard yeah. on this. And so if, <laughs> if, you, if Gillespie and I were to preach this, that's how the sermon would have ended, is that regardless of what happens to you, whether you return home to your family safely or not, mm -hmm. Jesus is risen from the dead, and so you too shall arise because mm -hmm. his promise and to you maybe a baptism, baptism holds... would be nice. Yes, there we go. Yes, <laughs> his promise <laughs> to you at baptism holds true that he drowned you in the waters of baptism and raised you up to new life so that you walk. How does Nagel say that? Wetly robed the whole way. Oh, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you've already drowned with Christ. There you well, go. Well, and, and to Tertullian's point, we are the little fish that are cast into the waters of baptism. And mm. so little fish never leave the water. Drawn in with the net of the church. That's what yeah. you preach to sailors. <laughs> right. you are, no matter whether you're in the water or out of it, you are a fish in the font of this baptismal grace. So whether you live or die, you are always with Christ. That would have been nice. Have yeah, it would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that'll be my third book. <laughs> Rewriting Melville. But um, awesome. You got anything else? Nope. Cool. Start, that was fantastic. That was fun. Yeah, um, that's a good story. I hope you're all enjoying this. From the feedback we've gotten, you guys are really enjoying this series on literature and the parables um, and theological musings of these different authors. I think so what it is week, is that like there's not two levels of interpretation. Correct. It's pretty straightforward. Right? The story is pretty straightforward, and yeah. then we get to we get to expand upon it. Yeah. Theologically. So maybe yeah. maybe next week we might dip into Flannery O'Connor. I've we had something one. else there's, that we were talking about. There's one about. called oh, we gonna, Revelation. You were going to do the, but I think you did it on your show, didn't you? What's that? The, the Dostoevsky with the um, with the conversation with the devil. No, I haven't done that on my show. I was going to okay. hold off for this one. Okay. So we can so come we'll back to that, that too. But there's yeah. a there's a great story called Revelation by Flannery O'Connor. Yeah, is we haven't done that. Before. Overtly Christian, like it's literally Christian. Like so, we need the, to do something like that. Okay, there you go. We definitely do. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to 1517. Thanks to our listeners. Go support the podcast and everything we do at 1517.org slash donate. Actually, Otherwise, we'll talk to you give. again real soon. <laughs> What's that? Give. Oh, we changed it to give now. I think donate works too. Whatever. You know what to do. Hit the button. Hit subscribe. Bell. Ringy dingy. All that stuff. We'll talk to you okay. real soon. Jesus bless you. Peace. There we go. Another one in the can, as they say. Okay. Very good.
All right. Ethan's waiting for me. So good. Thanks, everybody. He walked in on me. Bye.